genetic disorders. So that is why it is important. And uh, I'm happy to share that uh, Dr. Mayank uh, started a counseling uh, team. I think he is uh, also in charge of that team. Maybe he do counseling also. Uh, Twice a week, Dr. Mayan? Twice a week. Twice a week. Yes. So the patients and their parents will be really benefited by that. And that again initiated by the director, sir, because we guided him and then he started that committee counseling. And he's doing a wonderful job on the OPD part also and for the indoor part also. And some of the rare disorders he diagnosed during last couple of months, I think. Yes. And with that, he will be sharing. And I'm happy you have decided the topic which are very, very relevant in the current scenario. And uh, I hope everybody will be getting benefit from this symposium and they will learn a lot from this uh, scientific symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would request our Honorable Director, sir, to address the gathering. Uh, at the outset, uh, first of all, uh, my sincere uh, gratitude and heartfelt uh, thanks to my uh, Shukri Singhji because uh, you accepted our invitation. Uh, you, you took so much of pain of coming here, and we are really highly obliged that uh, you are here now and you participated in our uh, activities. And I'm sure your guidance uh, will lead us to a higher uh, place. And this institution needs your support. And uh, all the persons, all the guest speakers, uh, Dr. Poonam Nambi, Dr. Mahatya, uh, Dr. Ravni Kaur, Dr. Nayan, with our faculty, Dr. Meenal, Dr. Shivani, and uh, uh, all other. Uh, persons who have joined this uh, this uh, uh, activity event online and all my faculty member and residents who have joined uh, this event offline i on the behalf of the institution i extend once again the reward. welcome to you all uh, dr Mike is uh, i already uh, dr Dosna has said is doing a wonderful job and Medical genetics is now a very important uh, branch and uh, very high scope because I was told that about 10 to 15 percent of children who are uh, attending uh, our OPD, uh, neurology OPD, are having some type of uh, genetic background and uh, many, many things so called unknown or origin of the diseases. Uh, such as epilepsy, uh, dystrophy, muscular dystrophy, and all, are related now with uh, this gen genetic thing. So, uh, to know genetics is very important to sensitize the public and the general, uh, general uh, doctors, physicians, uh, is very, very important. And uh, I'm sure uh, such activity which we are organizing will help uh, the, the whole medical fraternity and uh, we will be able to find out one day uh, when we will be able to give answer to various uh, various problems. And uh, so once again, I am thankful to everyone for running this. And thank you, sir, for your encouraging words. Uh, as we all know, uh, our chief guest for today's session is Honorable uh, Secretary, Government of UP Medical Health Department and Director General, Department of Medical Education, Shrimati Shruti Singh, ma'am. Now I would request ma'am uh, to grace the audience uh, with her views on the topic. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Director PJ and CH, Dr. Rajan, Professor Ramadan, Senior Doctors, Faculty Members, Dr. Ramadan. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I could make it because it's a weekend and uh, uh, when Dr. Rajay invited me for this particular uh, event a month back, I was not sure that I'll be able to make it, but I definitely wanted to be a part of this to start with, to understand what all, is, what all activities are happening here. Uh, because uh, in the present uh, times and in the present government, we all know that medical health and very directly, it is a very, very top priority sector for the government. Uh, lots of things are happening across the health sector in the state. 
and uh, in the country also. And since it is a uh, huge priority for uh, Honorable Chief Minister and the whole government, a lot of uh, things are being uh, uh, proposed, a lot of things are being planned to uh, increase the health facility infrastructure in the state. And this is one of those institutes which I would say uh, uh, that we have ventured into a little, uh, uh, you know, a detailed luxurious uh, thing in the sense that uh, we were already overwhelmed with the routine uh, hospitals, routine uh, uh, to, uh, the diseases which are prevalent. To have a uh, particularly uh, a different separate institute, a whole institute uh, for uh, children. Uh, for pediatrics is, is a very, very good thing because uh, we know this, this uh, the catchment area for this institute is huge. Uh, it's only, I was told, the second institute in the state other than SGPGI, uh, which uh, has a such kind of facility when it's a, a separate uh, pediatric uh, hospital. And I'm told that already it's coming up very nicely in the leadership of uh, the uh, directors and now the president. Yeah, he has taken a very good interest, uh, but uh, it's not uh, <laughs> maybe I'm totally believing his permission has been granted. So uh, I hope uh, whoever reads it from here will also take a similar interest in the uh, development of this institute because it has huge scope. It is coming up very nicely, and I really hope that it, it, it uh, goes a very long way in uh, flag, flagging this uh, particular sector in the development of medical infrastructure in the state. Uh, the health infrastructure, uh, the government is doing a lot. We know we are coming up with medical colleges and we are trying to come up with, with the medical colleges in each and every district of the state. And uh, we are already doing it. Only 16 districts uh, are left in which we uh, are to set up medical colleges. Although there is a dearth of uh, doctors, trained staff, uh, non-doctor technical uh, staff also, but we are trying to um, uh, come up with, uh, with uh, new facilities of training of uh, doctors and uh, training sort of nursing colleges also. Look, lots, lots is happening that I have seen in the past month ever since I joined. Lots of things are happening. And uh, so finally, it's good to be here and be a part of this uh, uh, event. Particularly this topic, as Dr. Uh, uh, Jyotsna just said, it's a very, very relevant topic. And um, again, research uh, in this genetics, uh, medical genetics, and for children especially, which I was discussing with Dr. Ajay, it's a very relevant topic. And uh, the more we are able to spread the awareness and spread the uh, treatment and spread the knowledge, uh, early uh, before in the, in the what do you say prenatal period, the uh, more we can avoid such unfortunate instances of uh, genetic diseases in children, which, which uh, at the outcome it's, it's very unfortunate. Every disease is unfortunate, but children being uh, 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 these diseases, gen genetic diseases, is something uh, I feel as a non medical, I think it's very unfortunate for. The whole family, the babies. So good that we are spreading this awareness by these kind of uh, events. The more we can do it, the maximum we can do it. It's very good. So my congratulations to the institute, to, to the director, his whole team, and all the participants who are here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. On the behalf of uh, our community, we welcome you to the is serving uh, two leagues faculty who, who is on uh, contract, PGME contract, they are doing wonderful job. So uh, on the behalf of this institution, I perceive that we need more such devoted contract uh, faculty as well as uh, senior agent. So that we need, we are deficit in manpower, we have the potential, but we have deficit in the manpower. So if you could give us such nice provide more more in number uh, senior event as well as uh, consultant uh, we will be able to thank you yeah I Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I will request uh, the, our MS, Dr. Akasha, sir, and our executive assistant, Dr. Sumi, ma'am, uh, to uh, ask our chief guest and dignitaries for lamp lighting. 
as we all know any good thing needs to be started with some brightness so let's begin the session with lamp lighting Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, I request our uh, respected director, sir, to felicitate uh, our chief guest with the moment. Sir. Now we'll start with the sessions. Uh, uh, the first year person for our upcoming sessions is our respected CMS sir, Dr. Manish Girotra, who is also the head of department of ENT department. Uh, sir, I would request you to chairperson the coming sessions. Thank you, sir. Uh, our first speaker, sir, uh, Dr. Poonam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Poonam? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is so nice to be part of this symposium and thanks PGICH for giving me this opportunity. Special thanks to Dr. Mayank for inviting me to this uh, symposium and uh, it's nice to hear such good words and keep uh, seeing Dr. Mayank grow and we wish, wish her, him best wishes for the future also. So without any delay, I'll start my uh, topic. I hope everyone yes. can see my screen. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just. Okay. So, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, my uh, session of this 20 to 25 minutes will be mainly 
focused on case cases that we see in our genetic opd on a daily basis and especially those cases in which we are actually stuck up what to uh, you know counsel to the patient sometimes we are able to reach up to the exact diagnosis so the counseling is easy but sometimes it's it we are not able to reach to the final one and so difficult for us also to counsel and difficult for the parents also to take the decisions so um, this is because advances in antenatal ultrasound in terms of good equipments and skill of the doctors has allowed many um, um, uh, congenital malformations to be detected very early during the uh, pregnancy period and uh, over adding to this the modern genetic tests available in terms of chromosomal microarray and ngs based testings these can add on to our uh, detection yield and obviously finding out or reaching mostly to the exact etiology and it is arrived in many cases so genetic counseling overall provides information and support assisting parents to make timely informed decisions so my cases will be broadly covering the borderline ventriculomegaly agenesis of corpus callosum posterior fossa cyst and microcephaly so this uh, 24 year old primary gravida she uh, came to us at 20 weeks of gestation with this background information that her nt scan was normal but she had a high risk in the dual marker test for which the obstetrician had got an nipt done which was low risk for the common aneuploidy and she had brought this uh, normal growth scan of 19 to 20 weeks that showed a borderline ventriculomegaly uh, of 11 mm so with this uh, we offered her a uh, anomaly scan because she was at 20 around 21 weeks in which we also noted bilateral cerebral ventricle dilatation of uh, approximately 12 mm but the other uh, pointers in the brain were uh, practically normal at this gestation with third and fourth ventricle not dilated csp was well visualized but yes the long bones were slightly uh, at the lower centile in on the fifth centile so um, we know that prenatally detected ventriculomegaly has been uh, broadly grouped into by a sonologist into mild moderate and severe depending upon the diameter of the lateral atrial ventricular width so uh, the width and uh, um, actually if we take this case as a uh, isolated ventriculomegaly it is when we say that there are absence of sonographic evidence of associated malformations or any other markers of encardi although we cannot hello hello okay and uh, and yes, ma'am your yeah ma'am your screen was fixed in between can you repeat the previous slide i think some network issue at your end now you can hear me yes ma'am yes ma'am please go ahead so depending upon the different uh, etiologies of the ventriculomegaly which we all know the risk re recurrence risk actually varies so it is important and obviously the prognosis also varies so it is important to arrive at the etiological diagnosis so for uh, associated malformations we looked into the other non cns uh, um, uh, organs also and we did not find the spine was fine there were no adducted thumbs and there was no club foot Uh, but yes the long bones were on a slightly shorter side so mild ventriculomegaly of second trimester may not be mild in later gestation as normal in utero development of the brain continues throughout gestation so invasive testing followed follow up scans mri and postnatal examination of the baby is important to guide the parents what to do and what not to so in this case also we went ahead for invasive testing the chromosomal microarray was normal the torch pcr for infection was negative and on single gene disorder testing based on ngs we found a compound heterozygous pathogenic variant in kiaa gene that is uh, that is responsible for uh, on looking into the omim responsible for the celiopathy groups the 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 three variety of celiopathies that are uh, that are caused by the defect in this gene are jubert orofacio digital and short rib thoracic polydactyly so on re uh, revising the phenotype what is available as we know that in fetus it is the most big, biggest limitation is we are not able to 
have the exact phenotype. So whatever the information was available was a bit short stature and dilated ventricles. So on this basis, a uh, final diagnosis of celiopathy group of disorder was uh, identified in the fetus that is characterized by cognitive dysfunction, CNS malformation, retinal kidney, eye skeletal and other abnormalities. And accordingly, the parents were guided regarding the guarded prognosis of the baby. So they opted for termination of the pregnancy. Uh, this is the post-termination uh, examination of the fetus in which we could only identify frontal bossing. There was no polydactyly. Grossly, apparently, there was no disproportion in the stature as for now at this gestation when we saw the fetus. So, uh, a final diagnosis of Joubert syndrome was made and parents were, uh, parental testing was advised for further carrier testing and risk of recurrence in each pregnancy of 25% was given and which can be offered by CVS or amniocentesis. So in this case, actually, we were able to finally reach up to the diagnosis and a timely uh, decision could be made through the, uh, by the parents. In the second case, uh, she, is, she was a second gravida. She came at 28 weeks of gestation, uh, which was uh, definitely an advanced gestation with a uh, ultrasound picture of unilateral cerebral ventricle dilatation of borderline 10.3 mm. The other contralateral uh, ventricle was 5.5 millimeter only. Otherwise, all parameters practically were normal and growth was all normal. An anomaly, good anomaly scan was already she was carrying and that showed no uh, gross congenital malformation. Uh, the torch IgG IgM report was also being already done by the obstetrician uh, in, or, already ordered and she was found to have CMV IgG and rubella IgG positive, which I don't know what uh, actually to, you know, counsel regarding at this gestation about this IgG positivity. So, What is important in this case is that the, she is at advanced gestational age. And we counsel the family that both lower and higher rates of neurodevelopmental delays have been reported with unilateral ventriculomegaly. And so uh, uh, if we uh, uh, check out for the other associated brain abnormality, any primary brain abnormality. So for this, at this gestation, MRI is more informative. So she got an MRI done after one week and we got this ultrasound done at our center also. And it, it now it showed the lateral atrial ventricular width of left side of 12.4 mm. The other side was normal. She got an MRI done after fetal MRI done after one week at gestation age of 31 weeks. And then the atrial width was now 13 millimeter. And after that, the patient was lost to follow up. But uh, uh, because uh, it, it, we have inquisitiveness in our mind, we, I just contacted the family through phone because they were out of the town people. Uh, they stayed around 100 kilometers far away. So she responded very well to me. The mother responded me to, and she was very happy that uh, 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 we have a normal healthy baby, according to the parents. And she is now five months old and she is uh, gaining all the milestone because they had already uh, had uh, the experience of first child also. So they knew that uh, the, the, the proper milestones and they were definitely vigilant also. So they got the ultrasound cranium of the child also done every 15 days. After, uh, the first was done at 15 days of birth when the ventricle width were 10.9 and 10.1 on both sides. Then it was done at one and a half month of age, which was uh, the 9.5, 7.2, and then at 2.5 months of age, which was practically normal, 8 and 7. So these are the photographs at five months of age. And now just playing this video, the, you can see the milestone. She's responding. She's turning also. She's turning also at five months. And, and obviously, apparently, what the parents are assuming is what we can uh, see that they are right. And uh, practically, in the postnatal follow up, she's uh, apparently till five months of age. She's
Hello, ma'am. Ma'am, I think you lost the connection. Hello. Ma'am, you are not audible. Uh, audible. Kindly unmute yourself. Ma'am, you are mute. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Now the slides are visible. Kindly unmute yourself. Uh, ma'am, your voice is not coming. Ma'am, your voice is not audible. Okay, now I'm. Am I? Audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, right now you are audible. Please go ahead. Yes, so, ma'am. Okay. The prognosis in such cases depends upon any other associated CNS or non-CNS abnormalities. The etiological diagnosis if arrived at and in utero progression of the ventricular dilatation. Moving on to the next case, uh, this couple came to me at 23 weeks of pregnancy with history of previous child who, uh, uh, that expired on day nine of life. And probably the history was that the difficult home delivery was there. The baby did not cry at birth. They, he was admitted in an ICU on ventilator and probably it was an obstetrical cause. So now with, in this pregnancy, they had come with an anomaly scan report that showed that CSP is not visualized and uh, suggestive of agenesis of corpus callosum. The, so we all know with, this, that, uh, with the background that at, by 18 to 19 weeks, the corpus callosum should be visualized in antenatal scan. And if it is still not visualized by 20 weeks, we, uh, we have this thing in mind that in 20% of cases, it may be chromosomal abnormalities and in 50% of cases, the other genetic syndromes may be there. So um, in this case also, because she was at uh, 23 weeks, almost advanced gestation, amnio was offered, they opted for it and chromosomal microarray was done. And we found a uh, deletion, in uh, heterozygous deletion in the chromosome 3 that is uh, tip, uh, known in uh, as a known entity of 3q1 3.31 deletion syndrome which is characterized by marked developmental uh, uh, delays and characteristic facies so this family also um, uh, by this time the when the report came it was already two weeks um, advanced so she uh, the the repeat anomaly scan it showed agenesis of corpus callosum along with Colpocephaly also, the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles were dilated, measuring 11 millimeter. So this is her ultrasound picture. And so poor prognosis was explained in this case. It was easy for us also to counsel and easy for the patient also to take decision. And they went ahead for termination of the pregnancy. They brought the fetus for examination postnatally. And we can see the core species that is evident in the fetus and uh, uh, slightly uh, other subtle dysmorphisms also low set ears there were there um, and the, it was a female fetus. So now the, the, in this case, um, uh, if it would have been an isolated uh, agenesis of corpus callosum, neurodevelopmental delay is known in 30% of the cases. And in other cases, the prognosis depends upon the exact etiology. So in our case, because it was a chromosomal etiology and likely sporadic with this low risk of recurrence. But definitely for even less than 1%, prenatal diagnosis is to be offered into the next pregnancy and amniocentesis can be done. In uh, this uh, couple was actually a very uh, sad situation in this. She was 35 year old. She came to me in the early uh, uh, pregnancy with history of four early trimester losses. And this time she was pregnant at uh, 13 weeks and her, because of the four miscarriages, an obstetrician had already got the karyotype done for the couple and it was normal. Now in this NT uh, scan report, which, which was done uh, with, at our center, uh, we found it the increase intracranial translucency. So NT was normal, NB was normal, but the intracranial translucency is increased. So normally intracranial translucency 
uh, is if it is reduced, we we suspect neural tube defects in future. Or, and if it is increased, we have a suspicion of posterior fossa cyst or malformations in the future. Um, I think uh, some issues with yeah yeah can you hear me can yes, you hear me uh, yes, so, so this and we were fine we got a dual marker done which was also low risk uh, then we uh, advised them an early anomaly scan at 16 weeks which showed as we had suspected a posterior fossa cyst which was very either dendy walker variant or a Blake pouch cyst along with other findings also there was a single umbilical artery and mild oligoamnios. So with this uh, issues, we, you, you know, we counsel the patient, uh, we actually uh, de do not know what to counsel a bit of unpredictable type of who because she was carrying a very precious pregnancy, but we have to, you know, uh, counsel her about ki kya kya positive, kya kya negative issues ho sakte hai. So she said, I will go for an anomaly scan, further follow-up scan, and then decide whether what to do next. And invasive testing also, they were not uh, ready just because of that minor risk of miscarriage associated with the invasive testing. So we went ahead for a repeat anomaly scan at 19 weeks, which showed this uh, same posterior fossa cyst in the fetus. Still, we were not, uh, actually, it was not really a dendy walker, not really a Blake pouch cyst. And now the adding finding was CSP was not visualized and was suggestive of agenesis of corpus callosum. Now, because patient was counseled regarding the unpredictable and guarded prognosis and invasive testing was offered, but they denied and they went to a higher center for the second opinion, uh, where the at the higher center, the amnio was done, the chromosomal microarray was normal in this case. The single, by this time, it was already 23 weeks around. So single gene testing was uh, 24 weeks somewhere. So single gene testing, they did not opt for further because of the advanced gestational age. And a follow-up scan at 24 weeks now showed proper agenesis of corpus callosum with tear drop-shaped ventricles and a mild IUGR was also starting. Now the patient at present is now at 20, roughly 27, 28 weeks. She is still in touch with me at uh, phone, but uh, they opted to continue the pregnancy and we also don't know what is so this is actually a case where we are really difficult to counsel what to do and i'm um, uh, i pray it goes out okay for that patient but actually as a clinician i want to see what it happens and so it will help us to guide and uh, other patients in the future uh, uh, cases so this is another case in which the diagnosis was actually a straight away uh, diagnosis primary she came to us with this ultrasound report of absent nasal bone, Blake pouch cyst, and ecogenic intracardiac focus in the fetus. So because with this multiple soft markers, we went ahead with amniocentesis and it was a clear-cut Down syndrome. So here the diagnosis was also uh, made and finally arrived and the, the, the counseling was also easy for the, uh, the patient and decision-making was also easy for the patient also. So Blake pouch cyst, we have a differential diagnosis of uh, mega cisterna magna and arachnoid cyst also. Usually it is an isolated finding, but if it is associated with other markers, the chromosomal risk of chromosomal defects is up to 5%. MRI may be helpful to, uh, you know, find out the other brain abnormalities and uh, in non-isolated cases only we offer the invasive testing. Uh, the spontaneous resolution is seen by 24 to 26 weeks in 50% of cases and neurodevelopmental outcome is usually uh, good. The recurrence risk in isolated cases is, uh, is nil, almost nil, and in part of trisomies, it is around 1%. Uh, it's, it's actually the non-fenestration of the foramen um, agenda that causes this Blake pouch cyst. So this is another case in which um, uh, the lady had a bad obstetric history with one live child, five years alive and healthy, four miscarriages and four preterm deliveries. She was elderly. She was um, 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 she came to us at advanced gestation age of 32 weeks with the anomaly scan was grossly normal done at her uh, own city. And uh, what she brought was a scan at 31 weeks, which showed a posterior fossa cyst in the fetus. Now, we also got a uh, scan done at our center and 
we could just identify the cyst only uh, and the, the other cns was apparently normal though it is difficult to you know analyze at 32 weeks for the other cns and non cns at this gestation but we could only identify a and which was likely to be a uh, enlarged cisterna magna and the second differential was the uh, the arachnoid cyst so because um, uh, the enlarged cisterna magna isolated has usually a good prognosis so we offered the patient to to rule out actually the other non cns so we asked them to get a fetal mri done which was done and it also ruled out that it was not an arachnoid cyst not a black pouch cyst and it was the all findings were going in favor of mega cisterna magna so um, so it mega cisterna magna is um, diagnosed when vermis is normal and the cisterna magna size is more than 10 mm with a differential diagnosis of black pouch cyst and arachnoid and rarely deadly walker variant and fetal mri helps in excluding the differentials it is an isolated findings but in 10% of the cases in the follow up the ventriculomegaly may develop so four weekly scans is advised prognosis is usually a normal developmental outcome and no increased risk of pregnancy uh, what is seen uh, on the text and the other searches say that it is uh, if it is in postnatal cases if it is diagnosed on uh, imaging it is usually seen to be associated with infarction cme infection and sometimes chromosomal abnormality especially trisomy 18 so in our case uh, we had asked uh, uh, the patient to go for four weekly scans and postnatal evaluation of the baby by geneticist and a pediatric neurologist and obviously a postnatal mri this is uh, actually a um, you know we we did not arrive to this in final diagnosis but to uh, to start with this lady she came to us at um, 11 weeks of gestation with history of two children who had expired one male and one female at uh, in the toddler stage and uh, both had global developmental delay seizures microcephaly uh, the 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 antenatal and the birth history was uneventful but they could they were intelligent enough they they said that microcephaly of the baby or the small size head size was evident at birth so in the first child they did not get any work up done because they thought it could be just a sporadic event and next bachcha will be fine but when they saw the same thing in the second child they got the work up some work up done uh, in the second child the mri was available microcephaly with reduced pretentorial cerebral volume with some evidence of pachygyria and uh, neuronal migration disorder was evident but when she had come to us at second the third pregnancy the both of the child were not surviving and they are consanguineous couple also so with this background both male and female two children similarly affected consanguineous background so we thought of a some kind of an autosomal recessive primary microcephaly syndrome uh, and so we uh, uh, advised or counseled them that it, the risk of recurrence can be empirically 25% and if you really want to go for a prenatal diagnosis then uh, go for parental carrier testing so they got the parental the karyotype was already they had brought their report it was normal so the they got the carrier testing done but uh, as we know we are not always uh, at the end of the road in by ngs also so we got multiple variants in both the uh, the uh, partners and uh, all were of uncertain significance some were some had few matches with the uh, but because of the on the basis of uh, you know uncertain variants of uncertain significance we cannot offer the prenatal diagnosis so empiric risk of recurrence of 25% and four weekly ultrasound for head circumference was advised and uh, with the background plan that if if recurrence is there in the present pregnancy also then evaluation of the affected child will be offered so uh, now she is presently at 31 weeks she is coming regularly to me at she got the at 20 weeks 24 weeks 29 weeks so and 31 weeks ultrasound she had sent me on phone and uh, at her place she stays around 100 kilometers away and with god's grace till now the the head circumference and all are matching with the gestation although she says that in utero it started because in the th late third trimester the in the late second trimester ultrasound in the second pregnancy previous it could be diagnosed that the the head size is small 
what she as a layman she could tell me so by 31 weeks if the the head size is uh, going okay we are just uh, keeping our fingers crossed and moving and let us see what happens and what is in uh, the destiny of the patient this time so so microcephaly in 90% of the cases it is normal head circumference by till second trimester and after that it starts showing up in cases of in utero uh, 80% cases have normal head circumference at birth ultrasound diagnosis is usually arrived at late second and third trimester and uh, if if it is in second trimester usually there are associated cns abnormalities and those in the third that present in third trimester abnormalities of sulcation or neuronal migrations are more likely and chromosomal abnormalities are usually rare if it is uh, manifesting in utero while genetic syndromes are very very common and both uh, autosomal recessive and x linked are known prognosis in isolated cases risk of neurodevelopmental delay increases with the decreasing head circumference from 10% if head circumference is minus 2 to minus 3 sd uh, for gestation 200% if it is less than minus 4 sd at any gestation and in syndromic the the prognosis depends upon the underlying condition uh, recurrence is uh, depending upon the etiology if there are no associated structural defects it's 5 to 10% if it is familial found definitely like in our case the risk of empiric risk is 25% um this uh, so last case for uh, the session um, this lady she came at 31 weeks again she was such a late diagnosis and uh, with an ultrasound showing uh, bpd of less than 1% for gestation age while head circumference was corresponding to the gestation age suggestive of a dolicocephalic skull it was additionally a breech presentation and placenta was also fundo posterior so we got a, a repeat scan done at our center also at 33 weeks also 35 weeks also and it was showing a dolicocephalic skull so with this persistently breech presentation and a, a placenta with fundo posterior likely it was a, a, a counsel to the patient that though we cannot at this gestation rule out the genetic reasons or any you know uh, re, like craniosynostosis or anything but uh, because of the positional wo persistently the baby is breached the head is stuck up in the fundus with the placenta also behind although the lighter was normal but we we gave her a possibility of positional dolicocephaly also which has a uh, relatively good uh, neonatal outcome and uh, and postnatal outcome so at this is the the same baby at birth so head circumference was at birth was 35 cm af was open at level there was definitely dolicocephaly with slight tricephaly also uh, otherwise the baby was active crying weight was 3.5 kg uh, similarly the then after that i did not uh, happen to see the baby but i called the relatives and asked them to give me or share me the pic but they did not but whatever they talked to me on phone that presently the child is 2 month old has started partial neck holding has started smiling and reacting to the mother and according to them now the head shape is practically round so uh, uh, we should rule out the uh, we will take it hectically on a normal note and uh this is important that we should rule out or think for non genetic causes also in mind so whenever an anomaly is detected in fetus on antenatal scan it is necessary to determine the underlying etiology by uh, by uh, detail anomaly scan and see for the nature and pattern of anomalies good history with pedigree and antenatal history personal medical histories and we should and we should further move on for invasive testing then assess the prognosis figure out the recurrence risk and advise further testing during pregnancy or at birth and discuss all the possible management options with the parents so not every birth defect is associated with something we can do to prevent it but those we can prevent it we should do thank you and any questions thank you ma'am thank you so much that was quite an extensive presentation regarding the prenatal manifestations of these disorders uh we have requested the participants to ask any questions in the chat box right now we don't have any questions uh, so i think we'll move on to the next topic thank you ma'am thank you thank you so much thank you can you stop is uh, sharing the screen ma'am yes yes sir
so our next topic is on neurodegenerative disorders i i would request our chairperson to introduce the speaker the next speaker is dr moni ji bhatia she is the chief clinical geneticist and clinical medicine specialist at novel hospital rohtak haryana special interest in veterinary this morphology clinical medicine and skeletal dysplasia dr moni bhatia yes ma'am please start Uh, we we all will be try to be swift uh, as and discuss in brief regarding the topics uh, so that it gets uh, completed in time. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, is my slide visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please start. Thank you so much, uh, PGICH and uh, organizers, and special thank to Dr. Mayank for inviting me for this symposium. It is an honor for me to be a part of this educational webinar. and uh, thank you so much dr mayank you are doing a wonderful job keep creating awareness regarding the genetic disorders thank you I'll thank you talking on neurodegenerative disorders of the childhood and it is very vast but i'll try to be brief i'll tell you about the investigations examination finding and how to approach a case of any neurodegenerative disorder basically neurodegenerative disorders are the disorders when there is where there is degeneration of the neurons it can be adult onset or childhood onset we'll not discuss the adult onset disorders but those include alzheimers huntington parkinson disease etc and neurodegenerative disorders can be acquired or the genetic causes but we will be covering only the genetic causes of the neurodegenerative disorders so we usually suspect when there is regression of milestones it can be anything loss of speech vision hearing walking anything and it is usually associated with feeding difficulties seizures and impairment of intellect there are a number of classifications which are being used by different authors but we use this classification because based on this we can narrow down our diagnosis order the ancillary investigation then proceed for the genetic diagnosis so basically it can be divided into storage disorder these include a number of disorders like mucopolysaccharidosis sphingolipidosis mucolipidosis and so on in most of them usually there is hepatosplenomegaly the other finding like core species joint contractures can be seen in mps apart from that cherry red spot can be seen in number of disorders then angiokeratomas or uh, or the other findings can those findings are characteristic to different storage disorders then the next group is leukodystrophies these include canavan alexander mld ald crabbe and so on basically these leukodystrophies have white matter changes these are the white matter changes which are seen on mri apart from that there can be optic atrophy or macrocephaly can be seen in canavan and alexander disease spasticity is usually seen in leukodystrophies then we have another group of disorders which are the gray matter disorders where these include ncl epilepsy mitochondrial disorder usually they have epilepsy cognitive decline and microcephaly then we have a metabolic disorders these are the small molecule storage disorder or the inborn error of metabolism these include organic aciduria amino acidopathy fatty acid oxidation disorders etc usually in these disorder there is an episodic illness failure to thrive lethargy usually they present with acute sick me unit and there is an overlap of these disorders in different groups depending upon what part is involved and uh, how they manifest the other group is a basal ganglia disorders which include wilson disease neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation organic acid urea etc in these disorder usually there is rigidity dystonia dysphagia dysarthria slurred speech etc there then we have the spinal cerebellar degeneration where there is cerebellar degeneration or atrophy is there they usually present with a cerebellar signs these include frederick ataxia ataxia telangiectasia ataxia with vitamin e deficiency ataxia with oculomotor apraxia then the next group is the disorder where there is usually spasticity with lower limb weakness that is the hereditary spastic paraparesis then if there is peripheral neuropathy we would think of cmt that is charcot marie tooth disease or frederick ataxia or it can be one of the manifestation of any leukodystrophy another important is the red syndrome red syndrome is also very important because usually they have the normal developmental milestones till 6 to 18 months of age followed by regression and then microcephaly there are set diagnostic criteria based on which we suspect red syndrome and then accordingly only the molecular diagnosis is being carried out for these disorders then we'll not go into the details of the acquired causes these include various infections or any chronic lead poisoning or vitamin deficiency 
So how do we differentiate between these disorders? Like we have already discussed, if hepatomegaly is there, you'll think of more of storage disorder, spasticity, more of uh, leukodystrophy, rigidity and dystonia, more of basal ganglia disorder. Primarily, we divide them according to the age of onset. If the age of onset is at less than two years of age with hepatomegaly, you would think of glycogen storage disorder, Neiman pick disease, Gaucher, mucopolysaccharidosis. If the onset is at less than two years without hepatomegaly, you would think of white matter disorder like Crabbe, Canavan, Alexander, or mitochondrial disorder like Lay disease or any metabolic disorder. Apart from that, if the age of onset is later, then you would think of other disorders like neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation, metachromatic leukodystrophy, adrenal leukodystrophy, NCL, etc. So basically, based on the age of onset, you can try to narrow down your diagnosis and also based on the clinical features which we have already discussed. Another important thing by which we can differentiate is the skin findings. Like in biotinidase deficiency, we say that seboric dermatitis and rash is there. In prolidase deficiency, ulcerations are present. In GM1 gangliosidosis, Mongolian spots are present. So likewise, you can narrow down the diagnosis. Eye examination is also very important because optic atrophy is seen in leukodystrophy. Cherry red spot can be seen in number of disorders. This I'll be discussing in the case when I'll be discussing in my cases. Then corneal clouding can be seen in mucopolysaccharidosis, KF ring in, uh, in Wilson disease, etc. So investigations are ordered accordingly. The preliminary investigations, whenever you suspect any neurodegenerative disorder, are the MRI brain and eye examination. Because if MRI, there is leukodystrophy, you will think of those group of disorders, likewise basal ganglia disorder. The other are the ancillary investigation, depending upon what you're suspecting. If you're suspecting metabolic disorder, then you will order GCMS, TMS, lactate, ammonia, or if coarse facial hepatomegalia is present, then you will get the skeletal survey done to look for changes of dysostosis multiplex. And management is a multidisciplinary approach in liaison with the geneticists, pediatricians, speech therapists, occupational therapists, etc. Also, many a times it is thought that there is no point in getting the testing done because there is no treatment available for the disease, but there are few dis treatable neurodegenerative disorders like biotin supplementation is given in biotin days deficiency. In Wilson disease, zinc, triantine, deep penicillamine is being given. Likewise, in cerebral folate disorder, folinic acid is being given. Creatine disorder is also very important in which creatine supplementation can reverse the, pheno the mani uh, manifestations in 50% of the cases. Or if it is started early, it prevents the manifestation, the CNS manifestations. In neurotransmitter disorder, levodopa is being given. So coming to the case scenarios, this is the case of a one-year-old girl. She presented to us because the parents said that she had regression of milestones with the onset at six months of age. On examination, the child had macrocephaly and startle was also present and there was hepatosplenomegaly. Eye examination showed bilateral cherry red spot and in, a, in MRI, there was mild generalized atrophy. With the cherry red spot, we have two differentials in mind. That is GM1 ganglosidosis, GM2 sialidosis, galactosialidosis and a few other differentials. Then also in the x-ray, changes of dysostosis multiplex were present. So our differentials narrowed down to GM1, sialidosis, and galactosialidosis. Along with that, as you can see in the picture, Mongolian spots are also present. So our most probable diagnosis was GM1 ganglosidosis. So enzyme analysis was done, and it was found that there was deficient beta-galactosidase, which was going in favor of GM1 ganglosidosis. Option of molecular diagnosis was also given, but the family refused. But then we still stored the DNA. So as if, the test, if they want to get the testing done later, that can be offered to the family. But then they refused. And then when the mother was pregnant, next time at six weeks, they came back to us. Because the DNA was stored, we went ahead and got the molecular testing done. And then the mutation was confirmed in GLB-1 gene, which was a case of GM1 ganglosidosis. So based on that, we were able to provide prenatal diagnosis to the family. So it is very important if the family is not willing to get the molecular diagnosis made, that at least DNA should be stored so as they can get the testing done later on. This is another case. This is a case of an eight-year-old male. The male had poor scholastic performance. The parents gave the history that he had an incidental seizure in the class. On examination, there were mildly brisk DTRs and hyperpigmented knuckles were present. As you can see in the MRI, there is white matter hyperintensity present in the posterior part. So it is going in favor of adrenal leukodystrophy. For adrenal leukodystrophy, either molecular diagnosis is made or there is increased VLCFA, that is very long chain fatty acid level. When the sample was sent for VLCFA, first time the report came out to be normal, but we did not, we did not had any other clue, we did not had any other differential in the mind. Then we asked the sample, uh, asked the lab to do the reanalysis of this sample 
when the reanalysis of the sample was done, it was found that VLCFA was very high. So it was a case of extinct adenoleukodystrophy. Molecular testing was offered, but they did not get the molecular testing done. So if you have a strong clinical suspicion, you can ask the lab to do the reanalysis. Otherwise, we would have missed this case of ALD. This is another case of a 12-year female. She presented with a complaint of increased salivation. She had progressive slurring of speech. On examination, there were coriform moments were present. There was no family history, no consanguinity. And MRI showed bilateral symmetrical caudate hyperintensity. So it was a case of some basal ganglia disorder. At this age, we would suspect uh, Wilson disease or neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation. Eye examination was done and bilateral KF ring was present. So it was going in favor of Wilson disease. Further, ceruloplasmin levels were also checked and it was low. So finally, the diagnosis of Wilson disease was made. Then molecular diagnosis confirmed a clinical diagnosis of Wilson disease. So these were the cases in which we were able to reach to a diagnosis easily. There are some pitfalls in genetic testing. As we have already discussed, one case where VLCFA levels were normal and on, then on reanalysis, VLCFA was elevated in the case of X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. This is another case this family presented to us because the daughter had delayed developmental milestones, had myopathic facies and myotonia. The mother also had grip myotonia and also had myopathic facies. The family told that mother was a little slow in her activities and used, used to sleep a lot. So we suspected it, it is a case of myotonic dystrophy. When the testing was done, it turned out to be normal because this was the most probable diagnosis. The sample was sent to another lab where it was found that it is a case of myotonic dystrophy with expansion of alleles. So strong clinical suspicion is very important whenever we are ordering investigation for any case. This is a, another case. This case was referred because for prenatal diagnosis because of the previous child who had global developmental, uh, global developmental delay, seizures, and microcephaly. They had the report with them. Genetic testing had already been done somewhere out, uh, outside, and they had a report that multiple uh, two VUS was, uh, were identified. One was identified in DMXL2 gene, another was for the Dravet syndrome. Both were variant of uncertain significance. So based on a variant of uncertain significance, prenatal diagnosis cannot be offered. This was the case of NGS analysis. So thereafter, we ordered Sanger sequencing. And in the Sanger sequencing, variant was uh, SCN1A variant was identified. Whereas in DMXL2, where two variants were identified in the proband by NGS analysis, only one variant was identified. So based on that, all the more we were stuck and prenatal cannot be offered. But when the Sanger of the parents was done, it was found that all the variants were inherited from the father. Father was asymptomatic. So based on that, prenatal could not be offered to the family because anyhow, it was a case, uh, it was VUS and all the variants were inherited from the father. So it is very important when the, whenever the patient presents for prenatal diagnosis, you should look for the variant, do further analysis, do Sanger, do segregation analysis before, under, before asking the patient to go ahead with the invasive testing. Coming to the cases in which prenatal diagnosis was offered, this is a case of two boys similarly affected with developmental delay. No autism, no hyperactivity, no seizures, no other findings were present. It was a case of specific developmental delay, but both the, baby, both the children had long facies. The most common cause in which both the males have a mental retardation is the Fragile X syndrome. So Fragile X testing was sent, but it came out to be negative. So we thought it could be some X-linked mental retardation gene, which is responsible for causing developmental delay in the two uh, children. So testing was offered for X-linked mental retardation and the other genes which are associated with developmental delay. A, compound, a homozygous variant was identified in a gene which is responsible for uh, causing cerebral creatine deficiency disorder and was a missense variant and a known variant. So it was a likely pathogenic variant based on which prenatal diagnosis could, should be, could be offered in the next pregnancy and the fetus was found to be a carrier of the disease. The strange part is that usually this gene have number of other associated findings like it is said that seizures are present in 70 to 80 percent of the cases along with autism and the other findings which are not present in our case. All the more it is important if the diagnosis would have been made early then creatine supplementation does help in these families because if the creatine is starting early in uh, early once the diagnosis is made it prevents seizures and the CNS manifestation from developing in the child. This is another case of spinocerebellar ataxia where multiple family members had ataxia and the diagnosis was made in one of them. This lady came to us for predictive testing because she was pregnant. She did not have any manifestation. 
when the predictive testing was offered it was found that she was also harboring the mutation in sca2 gene atxn2 gene uh, the it is a triplet repeat disorder and also in triplet repeat disorder there is a phenomenon of anticipation that with the next generation the phenotype develops earlier in life so now doing the prenatal or not through the prenatal is on the discretion of the family because it is said that many many medical professionals say that it needs to be decided by the family that whether they want to go ahead with the prenatal diagnosis or not the prenatal diagnosis was offered to the family and then the pathogenic variant that that is the fetus was also affected but then even after getting the prenatal diagnosis done the family refused the family said that they want to continue ahead with the pregnancy the husband told that the wife is absolutely normal and we want to continue ahead with the pregnancy these are the cases uh, of neurodegenerative disorder apart from that here i would like to stress that normal genetic death test does not guarantee a normal fetus so this is a case of a non consanguineous couple they got a male child male child was delivered the baby had uh, was small for gestational age had bilateral absent thumbs and had subtle facial dysmorphism and the baby expired so we had few differentials in mind but no dna of that baby was stored so we went ahead with the testing of the parents both the parents were found to be a carrier of rql4 gene which is responsible for rotman thompson syndrome as it was matching with the phenotype amniocentesis uh, the prenatal diagnosis was offered to the family and it was found that fetus did not harbor any of the mutation which was present in the husband and the wife that is fetus was unaffected but the family was like that we want to get all the tests done whatever are possible we got get want to get all the tests done so as their fetus is unaffected so they also got the microarray done and microarray was also normal but then they were from a distant place they went back they did not came for follow up visit they were under uh, regular consultation with their gynecologist but then the patient had decreased fetal movements and they had their handheld doctor at home they used to measure the uh, listen to the fetal heart and they thought everything is going on fine one day she did not feel fetal movements at all and then after 3 to 4 days she went to the doctor and the doctor said that the baby is having fetal distress Uh, she, uh, the the lady underwent emergency cesarean section done and there was a thick meconium stain like her now the baby is having all the features of cerebral palsy and the mri also showed dilated cystic encephalomalacia so it is not that if you get all the genetic tests done that then you cannot guarantee an unaffected fetus or likewise this is not pertaining to neurodegenerative disorder but anyhow if you are doing the any prenatal diagnosis for any 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 case you are doing then also the baby with the sma or uh, or thalassemia or any other genetic disorder can be born so with this i would like to conclude my talk there should always be a high index of suspicion for neurodegenerative disorders if there is regression or severe developmental delay thorough examination is required proper history taking examination is required the ancillary investigation are required before jumping on to direct genetic uh, testing because if we have some clue some differentials in our mind then the yield of genetic testing improves reverse phenotyping should be done for all the cases once you have a genetic report with you you should go back to the case see whether the features are matching with the phenotype with the genotype or not or you can order further testing if required option of prenatal diagnosis should be discussed in all the genetic disorder here also i would like to discuss one case there was a case in which the, uh, that patient was referred to us for counseling because the baby was in nicu was comatose and then when the records were seen it was found that the she ha they had a previous two babies who had expired at one year and two years of age which H with hmg coel is deficiency when the family was asked why didn't you undergo the prenatal diagnosis in this baby because this baby is also affected they told that the doctor who who had ordered the testing for hmg coel is they did not tell uh, told them that it can recur in the next pregnancy and the last point is we cannot guarantee an unaffected child even after thorough work up thank you thank you so much ma'am that was a very nice presentation Uh, and as rightly told, uh, the main motive of this session is to create awareness not only among the patients as well as among the doctors. So they should be aware about the counselling for recurrence and all. Yes. I think there are no questions at present. Uh, we can proceed with the uh, next session. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Nayan Dile, Assistant Professor of Medical Genetics at Postgraduate Institute of Child Health, Madha, with special interest in this morphology in our. Inborn errors of metabolism, neurogenetic disorders, genetic metabolical disorders, next generation sequencing, and fetal medicine. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Hope my slides are visible to all. On the other side.
हेलो इज माई स्लाइड विजिबल यस ओके थैंक थैंक यू मैम सो बेसिकली आई गो स्विफ्टली फॉर दिस सेशन मोस्ट ऑफ अस ऑलरेडी नो दैट स्पाइनल मस्कुल एट्रोफी इज क्वाइट क्रिपलिंग न्यूरो मोटर न्यूरो डिजीज एंड लाइक इट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन जेनेटिक कॉज ऑफ इन्फेंट डेथ एज यू ऑल नो इट इट हैज ऑटोजोमल रेसेसिव इनहेरिटेंस एंड देर इज प्रोग्रेसिव सिमेट्रिकल प्रोक्सिमल मसल एट्रोफी एंड वीकनेस and uh, and most of the pediatricians and even neurologists know that the classification of the disorder is on the basis of the uh, manifestation of symptoms whether it presents in the prenatal stage then it it's like type 0 and if it presents in the adult group then it is type 4 the most important thing which i want to stress for this ppt uh, is the prevalence rate and the and the incidence uh, like as you see here the incidence ranges in different populations from 1 in 6000 to 1 in 10000 and the carrier frequency as can be seen it is quite high in uh, asians and arab population and even a us study in which some asian indians were uh, part of that study but the cohort was very small it was uh, one in 71 uh, similarly uh, when we uh, move to the next slide regarding the clinical presentation that most infants present with floppiness so basically any child presenting to your emergency or opd with floppiness and if there is paucity of limb movements and again if there is history of developmental delay then we should keep spinal muscular atrophy as one of the differential diagnosis most of these children have a reflexia when you are going to check for the deep tendon reflexes some might present with little uh, grade one dtr but that may also uh, uh, be lost with time some children may or may not have tongue fasciculations generally most of them have tongue, tongue fasciculations and when the presentation is in older age or in adults then again uh, there is history of muscle weakness hypotonia and the reduced and absent dtrs uh in this slide you can uh, see the different types of sma the only important thing which is common is like hypotonia is there but uh, the type 01 it presents in the prenatal stage and there the child after birth is having a severe respiratory failure so in your nicu if a child is coming who is having a severe respiratory failure and you are not able to find any other diagnosis you should uh, think about this and again uh, the, these children uh, may have arthrogryposis because of the paucity of the limb movements in the prenatal stage when they are present in the mother's womb uh, due to the less movements uh, the contractures develop in the joints so even uh, they can present with arthrogryposis in a newborn uh, similarly type 1 uh, the age of onset is within 6 months and again these children the only thing you need to remember apart from the floppiness uh, they have a partial head control and they are not able to sit even with support okay uh, they are not able to attain a seat without support they can be made to sit with support but whatever we have seen and even uh, you must have seen even when they are made to support there is curve of the back and they are not able to maintain their posture uh, and they, and the most important thing is that uh, like their uh, around 8 to 18 months of age most of them die with respiratory failure because of the weakness of the respiratory muscles and then when we come to type 2 again uh, these children the important thing is that apart from the hypotonia these children can sit independently but they won't be able to walk and uh, then uh, many of the sma type 2 kids have lived up to 20 to 25 years we have seen many patients who are very good painters or who are working quite well on computers uh, and then the type 3 type 3 generally presents in adulthood and the main complaint is the proximal muscle weakness the life span is normal and again here the patient can walk and all but he will have all those features of a muscle weakness type 4 it is in adulthood and again it presents with easy fatigability normal milestones are there and the main reason for all these as you can see ki why the different types as we go on increasing the symptoms are decreasing uh, this depends upon the uh, presence of the smn2 gene and the copy number variations in that gene which will be discussed further again the other thing which i want to stress for this presentation is the differential diagnosis which we should consider uh, for any child less than 6 months it is not only sma we should think about other causes as well even prader willi syndrome in a neonatal stage any it may present with hypotonia with feeding difficulties these are the overlapping features but again the important thing is that respiratory effort is not that poor in this condition then congenital muscular atrophy it may present with hypotonia but again it will also have eye involvement and possibly increased tone can be there then we have congenital myasthenia syndrome uh, which presents with ophthalmoplegia ptosis and episodic respiratory failure which are not present in sma and then pompe disease it also presents with hypotonia but again cardiomegaly should we should if it is present we should think for that and then in later childhood again dmd many times clinicians confuse uh, sma with dmd 
then the uh, differential is the increase cpk and the other typical uh, features of uh, dmd like gaur sign and all which we need to see then gillen barre syndrome in that also muscle weakness is there but you all know it has a sub acute onset and there is sensory involvement and you must have a history of prodrome illness and it it doesn't have a genetic basis till now and then in adults there is a kennedy disease which also uh, presents with weakness fasciculations and atrophy but decreased fertility testicular atrophy and gynecomastia can be there now what is the molecular mechanism of sma 96% of such cases are caused due to variations in the smn1 gene this is located on chromosome 5q long arm of the chromosome 5 and the commonest causative variant is deletion of the exon 7 and 8 or exon exon 7 only okay so the most common is the deletion of the exon 7 but if it can present even with deletion of exon 7 and 8 uh, this deletion is present in homozygous form around 96.4% cases of 5q related sma in the rest what about the rest 4 to 5% in that this uh, the one copy of smn1 gene as you all know there are two copies okay so one copy will have a deletion while the other allele will carry a sequence variation Uh, and even sma due to solitary deletion of exon 8 has also been reported in 1998 uh, so the pathophysiology there are two genes smn1 and smn2 which are present in close proximity and they produce a survival motor neuron so when two copies of smn1 are mutated uh, there is very less functional smn protein and the smn2 it cannot fully compensate for the loss of smn1 gene and this results in the phenotype of the disease but if there are there are duplications in the exon 7 and 8 of smn2 g then the phenotype improves like in type 4 sma there are four or five copies of the smn2 g so little bit of a survival motor neuron is produced and hence the symptoms are less now lab diagnosis if we do creatine kinase generally it is normal or mildly elevated emg if it is done then signs of motor neuron involvement will be there there will be denervation motor unit action potential enlargement and abnormal spontaneous activity can be there but again if you are suspecting the diagnosis is molecular testing two types of tests are quite commonly used one is quantitative pcr and other one is mlpa mlpa it will it may be discussed not a part of this presentation in the genetic testing mlpa basically it is a semi quantitative test and it is quite feasible and cost effective and it is being done in most centers in our country and it is the right now the first line genetic test for sma in this basically we detect the deletion as you can see this is the one of the reports uh, when we are seeing for the mlpa for exon 7 and 8 deletion uh, these here you can see the probes for smn1 exon 7 and 8 are showing the deletion while the smn2 exon 7 and 8 are showing duplication so basically this duplication is important not for diagnosis but for the uh, phenotype and for the treatment response so basically approach to diagnosis is we are suspecting we should go for the gene targeted deletion duplication again if homozygous is found then it's okay if it is heterozygous deletion we should go for gene sequencing if we are quite sure about the our clinical diagnosis and again if no deletion is there we should consider the other disorders which we have discussed in the differential diagnosis this is again the same thing which i reiterated like mlp and quantitative pcr can be done and on the basis of the number of copies we can decide whether it, it is 5q sma or not and then smn2 it has two values predictive value for the severity for the classification and inclusion in the therapies like more copy number in smn2 better response to therapy uh, the same thing is shown in this slide now what is important is genetic counseling carrier testing why carrier testing is important because in 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 an indian study one done at sgpj and the other even done at gangaram we found that the carrier frequency in our country is 1 is to 38 most of the arab countries even it is 1 is to 27 1 is to 38 is a very high carrier frequency it is around 2.6% okay 2.64 and the and the similar carrier frequency for thalassemia is 3 to 4% so as we all know icmr uh, uh, did a program for thalassemia and most of the obstetricians we are offering uh, the couples to go for thalassemia screening and the disease prevalence incidence every everything has decreased so we mean to say uh, because of this high carrier rate in our country we should also uh, advocate for the screening of couples for sma even some countries like turkey and all they have made it mandatory for couples to go for sma screening now false negative on carrier testing uh, by the, uh, this mlpa test sometimes false negatives will come like around 5 to 8% uh, percent of the populations they have two copies of smn1 gene on a single chromosome and deletion on the other chromosome this is known as 2 plus z 2 plus 0 configuration and in sub saharan africa it was found to be in a higher percent of population 
Till now, no specific test was there, but again, a new MLPA probe has come, which is P460, through which we can detect those with 2 plus 0 configuration as well. And now, when to initiate treatment? The decision of initiating treatment, again, uh, after diagnosis, depend upon the newborn screening if we found, like in most of the countries, it is a part of newborn screening. In, in the, the advantage of that is that the child gets diagnosed in the neonatal period, and all types of therapies which have come till now, like whether it is a new nursing, whether it is RISDIPLAM or whether it is a gene therapy, in all those trials, it has been found that if the treatment is initiated at an early age, there is a better response. This is the new nursing spin result. This is basically an antisense oligonucleotide therapy. I won't go into much detail, but you all should know that this drug is available to uh, many children with SMA in our country. And again, uh, uh, some trials were there before uh, starting of this and before bringing this drug in the market. The many such trials have been done before. And the inclusion criteria for this India trial was quite famous. It uh, confirmed diagnosis of SMA, age less than seven months, and at least two copies of SMN2. Uh, the, regarding the dosing, which you should know initially, this is a, there is a 12 milligram loading dose. This injection is given intrathically. And first three doses are administered 14 days apart. And then uh, the fourth loading after 30 days after the third dose, then we have maintenance therapy every four months. The problem is that this medicine is still very costly, not available. And, and no, most of the our patients won't be able to afford. But through various organizations, NGOs, this medicine is available to around 50 kids in our country. If at Ames Delhi and then SGPJ Lucknow and most of the centers, we are treating for this disorder. And again, there are certain neuromuscular scoring, uh, which you uh, must be knowing, hind tooth scoring. Then we have CHOP intent. This, this is a children of Philadelphia scoring system. And the total score ranges from 0 to 64. Basically, this scoring is done for any patient with SMA and neuromuscular disorders on every visit. And why I put it here? Because it is also required to see the response to the treatment. Uh, so basically, who is a treatment res responder? In their studies on this drug, spin result, they found that at least two-point increase in the ability to kick, or at least a one-point increase in the motor milestones of head control and other motor development milestones. They found it to be a target, like they achieved their target. Uh, what I mean to say that whatever the patients we have seen in our country who were started on this drug, most of these children got the drug after a late age, like most of the type one, type two, they got at uh, around one year, two year or three years. So uh, as if the treatment is started late, the response is not that good. But again, in foreign countries where it was detected at quite an early age, drug was started, then even type one patients can walk, which is a good response for the drug. Uh, certain other trials are there, I'll skip with them. Uh, certain uh, adverse effects can be there. like. Uh, lower respiratory, like you know, SMA is in itself, it may cause pneumonia, but even because of uh, Nusi nursing and uh, lower respiratory infections can be there, constipation can be there. Sometimes children are present with pyrexia, headache, vomiting, and back pain. Even thrombocytopenia has been seen in some patients. Uh, regarding uh, our experience, uh, as I told you before, uh, at, uh, when I was at SGPJ, around eight children had started on the therapy. The only good thing we found was that when the youngest type 1 child to receive the first dose but was at four months of age. And uh, you will be happy to know that the child is three years age now, is surviving, though she is not able to stand. But still for a family, type 1 patient, she must have, uh, if she, she wouldn't have got the medicine, she must have died, died around uh, 18 months of age, but she is surviving. Her motor milestone, she can sit. Uh, but again, I will again uh, reiterate that if started at early age, then only the response is there. And I won't say that there is a hype, but it is not, all these drugs are not that very magic drugs that if the child is floppy and he will start walking, it's not like that. It, the main thing is early initiation of therapy. Uh, this is the uh, career status, which we found in our study. And this is the, the new nurse and therapy being given intrathically. The other drug is the gene therapy. Again, a very talked about drug, 17 crore injection. Many times you must have seen for this crowdfunding and all. This is Onasemnigen, EB Parvobe. It is the world's most expensive gene therapy. It is FDA approved. And again, some children in India have got through some NGOs. And again, a very drastic response, like in outside, some of the children with this therapy, they started walking and all. But again, long-term effects need to be seen for any such viral vector associated gene therapy. Drug safety is important. Uh, Long-term effects we need to see. 
uh, in, the, in the, this slide I have shown the certain infusion instructions which should be uh, taken into account when dealing with any such gene therapy. The other oral drug is Rizdiplam. Uh, uh, currently, uh, it is approved uh, by FDA and uh, some children in India are getting this drug. But again, I would say not good response, not very encouraging response. There are certain, uh, uh, other drugs on the way like SMN2 splicing modifier like, like Branaplam and all are on their way. And some SMN independent approaches are also there. So basically still it is a hope. And that's why considering the, uh, the problem in getting the drug and seeing its response, I would still suggest preventive medicine is good. So we should ask the couples to go for the screening test, carrier testing, and if detected, then prenatal diagnosis and all can be done to avoid such pregnancies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand, covering this topic uh, nicely and stressing the need of uh, prenatal diagnosis and covering also the uh, recent advances in terms of gene therapy and other medical management. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, I see that there is a one question in the chat box. Uh, it's with uh, Dr. Poonam ma'am. Hello. Poonam ma'am, are you there? Uh, Dr. Neha has asked that, are you sending torch PCR for prenatal ventriculomegaly cases? Hello. Uh, Dr. Muni? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello? Yeah. Treat for uh, ventricular megaly. Even in the isolated yeah. ventricular megaly, torch PCR should be offered. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, I, I can see that there are no more questions in the chat box. We, sh we should quickly move on to the next session. Um, uh, our, our, chair, our chairperson for the next session is uh, Professor Dr. Joshna Madan, uh, and our next speaker is Dr. Shivani Mishra. Uh, Dr. Shivani, hello. Dr. Shivani, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Are you yes. able to hear me? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma Our chairperson will introduce you, ma'am. Okay. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think I am audible. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, we are now moving towards the second session of today's symposium. And uh, we will be having three talks in this uh, uh, session. And uh, the first talk is going to be delivered by Dr. Shivani Mishra on the uh, approach to microcephaly. And I think this is a very relevant topic that Dr. Mayan has selected because uh, nowadays uh, we all are discussing this because of uh, uh, Zika virus also. Because uh, most of the time there's a news with Zika virus and Zika virus is also associated with this kind of problem. So people are like a little bit, uh, I can't say they're aware of it, they're a little bit are, uh, aware of this kind of problem now. Dr. Shivani is an MD in Ops in Kaili from KGIU Lucknow. Then she did DM from, uh, in medical genetics from SGBJIMS Lucknow. And following that, she did uh, uh, training in uh, ultrasound of Kaili from UK. And uh, currently, she is uh, working as consultant clinical geneticist and fetal medicine specialist at uh, Alta Kaili Delhi Hospital and Apollo Clinic Dhanbad, Jharkhand. Uh, her research interests are prenatal and reproductive genetics, high risk pregnancies prenatal and postnatal risk morphologies, molecular genetics. And she has published more than 15 research, paper, uh, research papers in various journals. And uh, previously, she was associated with the uh, uh, Department of Medical Genetics, Kasuba Medical College, Panipal. Dr. Shivani, please, everyone is waiting to hear from you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your kind introduction. And I quickly want to extend my thanks to PJICH, Noida, and basically, most importantly, especially to uh, Dr. Mayank and his team for organizing this great symposium and informative session. And thanks a lot for inviting all of us. So not wasting much time, I will start with my lecture, Approach to Microcephaly. So it is actually a vast topic as you are also discussing Zika virus and other entities are also there. But I will make it quick and crisp so that we can understand the genetic etiology basically. So starting with the outline, I just want to... Uh, 
tell you what we are going to discuss in today's lecture. So we will just go through the development of the human brain so we can understand how the microcephaly happens and how it develops. Later, the most important thing, which is very confusing, is the definition of the microcephaly and it, there are different kinds of classification which are given and various terminologies are there. So we will quickly see that. We will go through the etiology as it is very heterogeneous. We will see the genetic aspects of microcephaly. And then we will discuss about the testing strategies and few case scenarios we will discuss later on. So starting with the human brain, quickly we will see, we also know that it is very unique. It is having presence of increased heterogeneity in the neural precursor population, which are actually absent or present in very low numbers in other mammals. So in the human brain development, if we will see it is determined through a tightly orchestrated and integrated process of neural cell proliferation, then there is expansion, few cases of migration from the basal, from the apical layer to the basal layer is there, there's ongoing organization, sneptogenesis, and then later apoptosis process also happens. So if anything of that is affected, then it can further lead to microcephaly. So starting with this picture, as you can see here, the apical surface is there and then the basal surface is there. At the basal surface, there is cerebral cortex, or we can say that the main uh, region where the neurons are formed later on, the dendritic complexity develops here only. So it starts from the uh, apical surface from where the apical radial glial cells, they undergo symmetric division, as we can see in the C picture, they undergo symmetric division, which is the initial process of neurogenesis. They later develop into the intermediate progenitor cells, which further undergo asymm asymmetric cell division, and they form the subventricular zone layer, where they uh, further undergo differentiation, forms the astrocytes, and in the later part of the neurogenesis, they form oligodendrocytes and pyramidal cells, which will later form the cerebral cortical part, which is the most important one. So any of these processes, if affected, even the migration of the cells, which are from the apical layer to the basal layer, if it is affected, then it will cause or result into the microcephaly. So starting with the human brain growth to understand this part, first of all, we need to know the first two years of the life, including the in, in utero life. These are the most important and crucial period for the rapid growth of the brain. Occipital frontal, occipital frontal circumference is 32 to 37 centimeter at the time of birth, and it grows like 4.4 centimeter per week during the first several months. Then in the first years of life, it is approximately one centimeter per month. And in adults, if we'll see in the males, it is 52.5 to 58.5 centimeters. And in females, it is approximately 52 to 58 centimeters. So it is how we can identify how the human brain growth affects the uh, brain growth affects the head circumference. So if we'll see in the first one year of life, the human brain develops approximately, which is similar to what happens in the next 17 years of life. So microcephaly, uh, we'll come into the main important topic. If we'll see the definition, how to define it, it is an occipital frontal circumference of equal to or less than two to three standard deviation below the age and gender related population mean. So if we'll see the window of two to three standard deviation, then what is it actually? Because if the patients are coming in the range of between two to three standard deviation, many are developmentally normal because it is actually the two standard deviation is actually the lower cutoff of the uh, normal population mean. Then it is uh, coming to the uh, range that if two standard deviation is there along with the syndromic features of some other neurobehavioral abnormalities they are there, then it could be considered. Now, if we see the etiology, then it is a heterogeneous one because there are many uh, genetic factors as well as non-genetic factors which are involved in the causation of microcephaly. As we can see, it is reported in more than 700 genetic syndromes, so we can identify the genetic etiology is the most important one that we need to identify. And the most important thing that we need to understand in the microcephaly is that it is a clinical finding. It is not a disorder. So we should consider it as a sign that if it is present, then we need to search for other markers also, other just start features also, other neurobehavioral abnormalities also. So we need to find out and we need to recognize if it is uh, fitting into some syndrome, if it is fitting into some particular disorder and go ahead with particular testing. It accounts for 15% of children referred to neurologists for evaluation of developmental disabilities. And if we'll see, then it is also associated with comorbidities like seizures, autistic behavior, abnormalities, and other birth defects. Coming to the definitions and classifications, 
we have come across various terminologies like primary versus secondary microcephaly, prenatal, postnatal microcephaly, even uh, congenital and developmental microcephaly, the autosomal recessive primary microcephaly. So we will see one by one how it varies. So in the primary microcephaly, it is actually typically termed as congenital microcephaly as the process uh, starts in the early period of neurogenesis. So defect is in the early neurogenesis. So in utero process of microcephaly develops. If you see the brain MRI, then there is simplified cortical gyral pattern that you can identify. No other syndromic features are found, including no additional brain abnormalities that you can detect. And there is impairment of the normal process of early neurogenesis in these cases. Now coming to another term that is autosomal recessive primary microcephaly. As we can see, it is primary microcephaly only, but the inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive. So it is giving congenital microcephaly. The... Excuse me. I think there is some disturbance. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. So in autosomal recessive primary microcephaly, it is severe congenital microcephaly where the head circumference is at uh, less than equal to four standard deviation below the mean at birth. And it is having intellectual disability also, which is in the absence of more severe neurological problems, including there is absence of developmental regression, seizures, spasticity, hypotonia. So all these features are not present. So neuro neurological, neurobehavioral abnormal abnormalities are not there. Absence of other syndromic features like uh, body growth abnormalities or additional brain malformations were also absent. So if you'll see the OMIM entries, then you can see there are approximately 25 OMIM entries with this name. Coming to secondary microcephaly, it is actually postnatal microcephaly, or we can also term it as developmental microcephaly or acquired microcephaly, because it develops later after the birth. So actually, process may start previously, but it is noticed later on after the birth. So brain had normal or near normal size at the time of birth and grows abnormally slowly thereafter. Most commonly a consequence of disruptive events in the post neurogenesis period. Mostly it affects the dendritic complexities, myelination, which is happening in the later part of the neurogenesis. Neuronal degeneration can be due to genetic or non-genetic reasons that we will see in the later slides. Next terminology is prenatal versus postnatal microcephaly. So we will see in prenatal microcephaly, as we can see, Prenatal means it should happen in, in utero. There should be an onset in, in utero. So it is congenital microcephaly. It is detectable prior to 36 weeks of gestation. Postnatal microcephaly is developmental microcephaly or it is an acquired microcephaly and it is detectable after birth. So if we'll see the causes, so in uh, most easiest way we can identify that in the prenatal one, it is the initial neurogenesis phase that is affected early onset degenerative processes which are affecting and it can also affect the white matter elements. In the postnatal microcephaly, it could be the block in the normal development which is happening in the later part of the neurogenesis like migration defects, dendritic, neuro dendritic complexities, formation of the glial processes. So all these parts can be affected. So it is also a degenerative process. So genetic etiology definitely is there, but if we'll see the non-genetic causes, then in the prenatal microcephaly, it is a destructive event prior to birth, which is happening, like any vascular event, like placental insufficiency, if it is there and it is affecting uh, the growth of the brain. Secondly, in the postnatal microcephaly, if you will see, then it could be perinatal insert, prenatal insert, perinatal asphyxia, that could be a cause. So a few examples are written. So we will see one by one the later slides. So coming to the etiology, so it is having a heterogeneous etiology. So genetic components and the non-genetic components, they are there. In the genetic components, we can see that gross chromosomal abnormalities could be there. So in that case, if you're suspecting, you can go ahead with the karyotype, which is very less in such cases. If you will see uh, that intellectual disability is also there, copy number variation could be a reason because of that it is happening. So microdeletion, microduplication cause could be there. Single gene disorders could be there, which is the most common among them. Then non-genetic causes are also there, like in utero or congenital infection, as we were discussing, like Zika virus is very important nowadays. So Zika virus, CMV, that is torch infection, HSV, which is a part of torch infection, varicella, syphilis. So these could be 
uh, the major congenital infections which can lead to microcephaly. Then teratogenic exposure like maternal alcohol, cocaine intake, anti-epileptic drugs, lead or mercury. So these can lead to microcephaly. Maternal illnesses, the most important one is the poorly controlled diabetes in the mother. Then hyperphenylalaninemia. Then vascular insults, as we discussed, placental insufficiency or the perinatal asphyxia if it is there. Coming to the genetics, so this is the most important thing which we need to discuss in today's lecture. So in genetics, the congenital microcephaly cases, if we'll see the primary microcephaly, as we have discussed, is mostly autosomal recessive, but which genes are affected? So here we can see because it is the early neurogenesis process which is affecting. So the cell division process should be affected. So it is centrosome centriole biogenesis pathway or the DNA repair pathway, which is affected most commonly. So centrosome specific proteins, spindle associated associated proteins, kinetico associated defects are there and the damage in the DNA repair pathway could be there. So in this particular slide, you can see I have highlighted ASPM gene, because, which is spindle associated protein. So this is the particular gene which is the most common and the most commonly affected gene and it, it accounts for around 35 to 45% cases of the primary microcephaly. So if you are suspecting and you have the uh, primer for this particular gene sequencing, go ahead with the uh, ASPM gene sequencing. But uh, if you have primers for that. Microcephaly with complex brain malformations, uh, if it is associated with brain abnormalities, then microtubule associated genes could be the cause, and tubulin family could be the one, and kinesin protein like K, uh, KIF11 and KIF14 could be the reason. Now we'll see a few of such cases. Here we can see like Seckel syndrome. These are the cases of primary microcephaly. So in Seckel syndrome, there is pre and postnatal growth deficiency that is there. And in the picture, if you can see there, is just, there are dysmorphic features like child presented with uh, microcephaly, intellectual disability is also there. They have weak nose, receding mandible is there, large prominent eyes are there. So they have a bird beak appearance sort of feature. So this is a sickle syndrome and the genes which are involved are in, involved in the centrosome central biogenesis pathway. Next is MOPD1-2. So it is microcephaly primary dwarfism, primordial dwarfism. So here also severe IUGR is present and child presents with microcephaly. There could be mild ID to normal IQ and structural brain malformation could be there. So skeletal abnormalities could be there in such cases like uh, rib abnormalities or the skeletal abnormalities. Next is the Bloom syndrome. So here you can see that it is because of DNA repair defects. So here, apart from the microcephaly, there are features of uh, telangiectasia, hypohyperpigmentation, sun sensitivity could be there. There are predisposition to malignancy as well. Next one is the mayer golan syndrome, which is having an uh, important feature of bilateral microtia, aplasia, or hypoplasia of the patella could be there. Microcephaly is there, but the, uh, but the intellectual disability is not found in these cases. So this is how you can differentiate among the cases. So these cases, they are all uh, inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, and accordingly, you can provide the risk of recurrence in the subsequent pregnancies. Now, coming to the postnatal microcephaly, if we'll see the genetics of postnatal microcephaly, then it is extremely heterogeneous. So here you can see that different, uh, different genes are involved, like transcriptional regulators are involved, then neural, neural migration defect genes could be there, then DNA repair defect genes could be, or DNA repair genes could be there and defect can lead to microcephaly. Inheritance, inheritance pattern can also be uh, seen that is variable. So here you can see if you're talking about the red syndrome, then it is MECP2 related disorder and it's a, it is inherited in an X-linked manner. Mostly it affects the females and in the males, uh, it is uh, highly lethal. So if you see another syndrome like cocaine syndrome, then here you can see that uh, DNA repair genes are involved and all the features of DNA repair defect pathways are present in such cases like sun sensitivity. And you can also see the uh, risk to the infections and malignancy in such cases. Then there is imprinting defects also. So you can see that in an angel men syndrome, postnatal microcephaly develops. So this is how you can differentiate among the cases and you can recognize the pattern and further order the testing accordingly. So if a patient is coming with microcephaly to you, then if with the initial assessment, you can identify what it what it could be and further reach to the differentials. 
So always as we start with the history, the age of onset of microcephaly should be identified, OFC at birth should be taken and should be taken care of. History of antenatal insults and maternal illness should be identified, whether there is a, a diabetes mellitus in the mother, is there any fetal exposure to alcohol, drugs, infections like uh, torch infections or Zika virus infection or toxins as we have discussed about the diabetes mellitus and maternal hyperphenylalaninemia. It is most important because in such cases, there's 100% recurrence rate if you have not picked it up. Now, now, next thing that you should identify whether any other sibling is also affected, whether, whether any other relatives are affected, for that you need to identify the three generation pedigree and parental consanguinity should also be asked. Then going through the examination, thorough general and neurological evaluation should be done. And coming to the neuroimaging, CT and MRI should be done. CT should be done in such cases where you're identifying that it could be a congenital infection. So in those cases, you can see the calcifications on CT. And you can uh, go ahead with the identification and further testing. But in MRI cases, you can get the picture of uh, volume loss in the cerebrum, you can identify the corpus callosum defect and pontocerebellar dysplasia, hypoplasia if it is there, and most important one, the simplified chiral pattern if it is present. MRS could be ordered if you are suspecting any neurometabolic cause of microcephaly and in such cases like, for example, brain creatine deficiency syndromes. After all these workup, you can come to some differentials and further you can go ahead with the testing strategy. Before that, we will discuss about the neuroimaging uh, things first. So here, uh, whenever you are order ordering the brain MRI, you always have to see the sagittal and axial planes. So in the uh, sagittal and axial planes, we always need to compare it with the normal of the same age. So on comparison, you can identify that there is some volume loss, there is simplified chiral pattern, it is microcephaly. On that basis, you can come across with the diagnosis. So in neuroimaging finding, the most important one is the simplified gyral pattern, which is seen in primary microcephaly. So if you see the A picture is the normal brain uh, MRI. And if you'll compare with the B picture here, you can see that microcephaly is there. The surface area is smaller in such case, but the relative, uh, relatively normal uh, gyri and sulci pattern is seen. But definitely microcephaly is there. Next is the C picture. Here you can see in this patient, microcephaly is there and there is simplified gyral pattern because here you cannot uh, see the, uh, the gyria and sulcar. In the brain imaging, the most common finding as we have discussed is the simplified cortical gyral pattern, uh, which is actually diffuse, but sometimes it could be disproportionately affecting the frontal brain. Next is additional brain abnormalities can also occur with microcephaly. Partly it depends on the underlying etiology also that what is affecting. So cortical malformations could also be there like pachygyria, polymicro, uh, microgyria, dysgyria, all these problems could be there. Callosal abnormalities like thin or small corpus callosum could be there. Abnormalities of the cerebellum, brainstem, pontocerebellar hypoplasia, basal ganglia abnormalities, white matter abnormalities, they could be there. So accordingly, you can plan what testing is needed. Coming to the testing approach, as we have discussed about the initial assessment, after that, you can come across with the differentials, whether it could be congenital or it could be postnatal. In congenital one, if you are seeing that uh, it is not a syndromic one, but variable growth retardation is there and primary microcephaly you are suspecting, go ahead with the NGS panel if it is available. But, in some, uh, but sometimes in the panel, few genes which are coming new, they are not involved, go ahead with the whole exome sequencing. Then syndromic, if you are suspecting some particular syndrome, like it is there and recognizable phenotype is there, like we have discussed about the ASPM1, but it is very difficult to identify. But if you are identifying and you have the gene, uh, sequencing availability with the primers, then go ahead with the appropriate testing. Next is unrecognizable phenotype. You are not going to identify anything, but still primary micros uh, microcephaly is there, but you are not aware what it could be. Go ahead with step-by-step -step strategy, CMA and whole exome sequencing, but yes, uh, before that, you need to identify the pedigree, whether consanguinity is present or not, whether any other sibling is affected or not. Similarly affected sibling, if it is there, go ahead with the whole exome sequencing. And if it is not, then uh, go ahead with step-by-step -step strategy. Similarly, in the postnatal cases, uh, who are having uh, OFC normal at the time of birth, if you are seeing a recognizable phenotype, go ahead with the targeted testing. If it is unrecognizable, 
go ahead with the CMA and WAS, that is whole exome sequencing step by step. So in postnatal, the recognizable phenotype could be Red syndrome, it could be uh, um, Rubenstein Tabi syndrome. So on that cases, what is needed? Either uh, chromosomal evaluation is needed, like Miller Dicker syndrome, what it is actually needed, go ahead with that particular testing strategy. So before ordering the testing, which particular test is needed because we all know genetic tests are very costly. So we need to do the correct phenotyping. So it actually requires individual expertise as well as team expertise. So uh, you should refer to the neuro uh, neuroimaging uh, experts. Also, you should refer to the geneticist before ordering the test. And after getting the NGS results, go back to the phenotype that what is missing and what is not missing because sometimes it, uh, if it is missing you will miss the diagnosis so always you need to do the reverse phenotyping it will explain the phenotype completely now coming to the case scenarios this is the first case so here we can see that the consanguinously married couple are presented with the child at one year of age with the uh, features of developmental delay and the child having primordial dwarfism. When we evaluated the child, later on we ordered the test also, and when uh, again child presented, child was four years, female child presented with primary primordial dwarfism with developmental delay and spasticity. And when we examined child having microcephaly at minus six standard deviation, length 61 centimeter, that is at minus 12 standard deviation, and weight at 3.7 kg, that is minus eight standard deviation. Previous one child was normal uh, to that couple and one abortion was there. And after that child also, they conceived and one more abortion was there. So uh, after doing uh, all the evaluation, we come to the diagnosis that it is not a recognizable pattern. So we go ahead with the whole exome sequencing because it is a consanguinously married couple. So we go ahead with the whole exome sequencing and what we got, it is a homozygous variant in the ASPM gene. So we come to the conclusion that this is microcephaly 5 primary autosomal recessive. So as we have discussed, ASPM gene is the most common one, which accounts about 35 to 45% cases of primary microcephaly. This is another case where we can see that this is non-consanguinously married couple uh, came with the child presented at the neonatal period of uh, one month and later child also died. Uh, they have the complaint that the child is having hypotonia, having fits, uh, and child went into encephalopathy. And when we evaluated the records, child had intrauterine growth retardation also, and microcephaly, that is at minus three standard deviation was present. Hypertonia was seen, clonus was present. So neurological abnormalities are also there. When we see the neuroimaging picture here, we can see the microcephaly is there with the overlapping sutures. The simplified gyral pattern is there. And here we can see that the pontocerebellar volume is also lost there is a reduced volume of bonds and cerebral atrophy is also there so we don't know what it is actually so we ordered the whole exome sequencing and later on we uh, got the homozygous variant in index patient and the parents were heterozygous carriers for the same and the variant was found in asns gene so here we conclude that uh, it is a autosomal recessive inheritance pattern and 25% risk of recurrence in the subsequent pregnancies there. So this is aspargin synthetase deficiency. Similarly, we saw another case where the child presented at around one year of age and in infancy only and microcephaly at minus nine standard deviation was there and the neurological features in terms of hypertonia, spasticity, exaggerated DTRs are there. And when we saw the neuroimaging picture, the similar type of features were present as we have seen in the previous uh, example. So here we uh, did the uh, whole exome sequencing and we found that there is compound heterozygous variants present in the proband and parents are heterozygous carriers for those variants. So this is also aspargin synthetase deficiency. So this is how we learn. So here we uh, identify on neuroimaging that we have seen such type of picture and it could be aspargin synthetase deficiency. Coming to the postnatal microcephaly, so here uh, is a case where seven-year-old female child presented to the OPD with the, par with the parents. So uh, child presented with global developmental delay, absent speech was there, and microcephaly was also there, which is at minus 4.5 standard deviation. No regression, no history of scissors, behavioral abnormalities like... Uh, uh, repetitive behavior sometimes is also there and knee DTRs were exaggerated. So we did 
whole exome sequencing and we got the de novo heterozygous variant in Fox G1. So it is a red syndrome congenital variant. Similarly, this child presented to the OPD, this is around four or five years old uh, female child presented to the non-consanguinous parents. And uh, this child presented with intellectual disability when we evaluated then microcephaly was there. And when we see the uh, uh, features of the face, so here you can evaluate that the nose is having a peculiar overhanging columella. So in this picture, actually it is not very uh, prominent, but child was also having lateral deviation of the thumb and lateral deviation of the toe. So a gestalt appearance shows that it could be rubinstein tebe syndrome. So we go ahead with the, with the testing and we go, got the pathogenic variant in CREVBP gene. Similarly, this child presented with developmental delay. Seizures were also there and uh, hypopigmentation uh, patches can be seen in the skin. So this child actually presented mainly with the complaint of seizures. So when we examined, evaluated, ataxia was also there. Seizures were there, microcephaly is there, developmental delay is there, hypopigmentation there. So it fits into the diagnosis of Angelman syndrome. So we ordered the methylation analysis and the diagnosis was proved. So coming to the key messages after the lecture, the most important thing is microcephaly is actually microcephaly is actually a clinical finding. So it is actually a sign and it should not be considered as a disorder. So whenever you see microcephaly is there, search for other, other features so that you can reach to some recognizable syndrome also, but it could be present in isolation as well. Etiology is heterogeneous. Genetic etiology is a key cause in many. So genetic testing should be ordered. Genetic testing is the most important key uh, part because it provides the risk of recurrence and prenatal diagnosis. The most important thing is even if you'll do all the testing, even in the 40% cases of microcephaly, the diagnosis is not proven. Detailed phenotyping and reverse phenotyping, it plays a very important role to reach the correct diagnosis and to uh, reach the uh, diagnosis uh, uh, of the child. Lastly, I want to thank to the patients and their families, and most importantly, to my Department of Medical Genetics when I was working in Kasturba Medical College because I have seen all these cases over there. So really, I'm very thankful to the department. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Uh, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, Thank you, now, Dr. Shivani. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, yes, and it was a very nice talk and uh, you covered very nicely the prenatal, the postnatal, and how to assess the condition, the genetic causes, non-genetic causes, the basics you also covered. And cases were very nicely covered that created some kind of interest uh, in the audience. I think when you discuss the cases, it's always very interesting. Your presentation was very nice. And thank you so much for being with us during this uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Shivani. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Mayank, I think we are now going for the second talk. Yes, ma'am. Uh, talk by Dr. Abhid. Uh, Dr. Abneet is with us. Yes, ma'am. Join the screen. Okay. Uh, the, the second talk is uh, going to be delivered by Dr. Abneet Kaur. And uh, the topic uh, for her presentation is the uh, neurocutaneous disorders. Uh, Dr. Ravneet has done uh, her MD pediatrics from GMC Patiala and then uh, DM in medical genetics from Ames, New Delhi. And currently, she is working as consultant clinical geneticist at Motherhood Chaitanya Hospital, Chandigarh. And she has published more than 10 research papers in various national and international journals. And she has uh, the interest in uh, inherited uh, metabolic disorders, clinical dysmorphology, and molecular genetics. She has also worked as assistant, uh, ex assistant professor in uh, RML Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Ravneet, uh, please go ahead. And uh, we are ready to listen to you. Yes, Dr. Avneet, please. Thank you uh, so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you to J.K. Maida and uh, thank you, Dr. Mayan, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, shall I uh, share my screen, Dr. Mayan? Yes, 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 doctor. Mm -hmm.
Uh, okay, uh, is my presentation visible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Okay, uh, so uh, my topic is uh, neurocutaneous syndromes. So I'll be uh, very fast yeah, due to lack of time, I suppose. So I'll be uh, just briefing with a uh, few cases. So my first case is a six-year-old female child who presented with blurring of vision. And uh, on examination, her uh, iris had some yellowish spots over uh, her and MRI showed optic pathway glioma. And on physical examination, she had multiple cafeteria spots. And on familiar examination, her father, uh, who was 35 years old, who had uh, multiple nodular swellings over the skin, which were cutaneous neurofibromas. And he also had a plexiform neurofibroma on his left palm. And his iris also showed rich nodules. So uh, my next case, uh, I'll tell you the diagnosis later when I discuss the individual syndrome. So my next case is a nine-month-old female child who had infantile spasms and then MRI showed some thickened uh, cortical tubers and on her skin, we had some hyperpigmented lesions. And also her father, who was 30 years old, who was intellectually normal, he had an adenoma sebaceum over his face and also a chagrin patch over his back. And my third case uh, is a, a small baby who's eight months old male who has a port wine stain over his face and the MRI showed uh, tram track calcification and hemicortical uh, atrophy. So all of these uh, three cases, these are some neurocutaneous syndromes. Uh, so what are neurocutaneous syndromes? These are actually a group of disorders which affect the skin and the central nervous system together. So these are basically defects of the developing embryonic ectodermal tissue, which will give rise to both the skin and also the nervous system and also some part of the eye. So some of them have uh, manifestations who affect the eyes also. This was originally used by Vanderhoof in 1923 to describe neurofibromatosis and tuberous sclerosis. But then additionally, some syndromes were also added later on. So uh, these are some common neurocutaneous syndromes, uh, which is neurofibromatosis type 1 and 2, tuberous sclerosis, sturge syndrome, VHL, incontinentia pigmentae, clipotronone, and encephalocranial cutaneous lipomatosis. We'll be very briefly discussing some of them and not all of them. So they have some common characteristics, uh, all of them. So these are genetically determined. Uh, most of them are congenital. Autosom they have autosomal dominant inheritance, most of them, not, not all, and they have a very variable expressivity. And uh, they have uh, most of them have dysplastic lesions with a neoplastic potential. So, so they, it's not always that every, everything would turn into a neoplasm, but some of them can turn into a neoplast uh, neoplasm. So I'll start with neurofibromatosis. So neurofibromatosis is characterized by formation of multiple nerve sheath tumors. Uh, so there are two types of neurofibromatosis, type 1 and type 2, which uh, type 1 is caused by a gene named as NF1 and type 2 is caused by a gene named as NF2. And both of their proteins are neurofibromin and Merlin. So the first case that I discussed, uh, this child who this, uh, this child who was a six-year-old female child who presented with blurring of vision, she actually had an optic pathic glioma. And on her skin, we can see uh, there are small, small hyperpigmented spots, which are called caffeolis spots. And uh, her iris also had uh, yellowish spots that were the lish nodules. And now her father, who is 35 years old, this, his skin shows uh, multiple nodular swellings, which were cutaneous neurofibromas, and this black colored uh, tissue. This is a plexiform neurofibroma on his left palm. He also had iris lish nodules. So we, uh, we can see there's variable expressivity. So, so her, her daughter is uh, manifesting in a different way, and the father is manifesting in a different way. So this is a very common feature of uh, neurocutaneous syndromes, that they have a variable expressivity, but the penetrance is complete. So complete penetrance means all, they have almost 100% penetrance. So, so anybody who has a mutation, so anybody in the family who has this mutation will manifest the disease, but they can present in uh, any way. So they can present with uh, caffeine spots or they can present with neurofibromas. So everybody will present in a different way, but they will have a complete penetrance. So uh, NF type 1 is the most common uh, of the neurocutaneous disorders with an incidence of about 1 in 2500 to 1 in 3000. It's autosomal dominant and 100% penetrance with variable expressivity. So there are some diagnostic criteria which are, which are given by NIH, that is National Institute of Health. So uh, they say that any two of the following uh, features like six or more caffeine macules, ancillary vinyl freckling, uh, more than two cutaneous neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma, optic pathic glioma, uh, iris lish nodules or a distinctive osseous lesion like sphenoid dysplasia or a pathogenic NF1 variant or a first degree relative with NF1. So any two of these following will classify into a neurofibromatosis type one. So the diagnosis is mostly clinical uh, but we can do the genetic testing also. So for prenatal diagnosis, we actually need the genetic, genetic testing, but, uh, but the diagnosis for the proband is mostly clinical only. Additionally, they can have some additional features which do not classify into the diagnostic criteria, but they are mostly found in these people. So they can have microcephaly, short stitches, seizures, learning disabilities, autistic features, hypertension, and malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors. That is present in only 1% of the population, but that is actually the, the, the uh, dangerous part of the disorder. 
then uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 uh, is a bit less common that is uh, an incidence of 1 in 30000 to 1 in 40000 that also has some diagnostic criteria but the most common thing is a bilateral vestibular schwannomas so when i'll be covering the diagnostic criteria that is this is a theory thing so for the diagnosis the adults mostly present around second to third decade with hearing loss tinnitus and imbalance and on examination and on the neuroimaging you have we mostly found these bilateral acoustic uh, neuromas and in children, they present uh, at around six to eight years of age. So this is this presentation in children is very, very less common, but they present with some skin tumors and with seizures. So pathophysiology, both of these NF1 and NF2, they have the same pathway. So this is basically the growth factor receptors and uh, these uh, NF1 and NF2, both of these proteins, so neurofibrin and merlin, both of these proteins, they actually just regulate the cell cycle. So, so the pathway that, uh, that actually leads to the cell cycle, I mean, the cell division, they just regulate it, they inhibit the cell cycle control. So, uh, so if, if any of these protein is lost, it will lead to an uncontrolled division. So when there's uncontrolled division, it will lead to the formation of the tumors and it will lead to the formation of the uh, neoplasms. So for the management, um, so optic glioma is managed with chemotherapy and palliative surgeries can be done. For cutaneous neurofibromas, laser therapy uh, can be done uh, or surgical removal can also be done, but then that is only cosmetic and the chances of recurrence are there. So mostly <coughs> we do not touch them. Uh, so then for the plexiform neuromas, uh, we just have to monitor for the malignant transformation. And now, it is, uh, for more than two years uh, age, selimitinib, that is the MK inhibitor, is approved by FDA very recently for the inoperable tumors. Then for the long bone dysplasia, surgical correction is recommended. And for osteoporosis, that is also a major concern in these people. So vitamin D and bisphosphonates are recommended. But the most important part of the management is the surveillance. So we have to do annual uh, eye examination, physical examination for the malignant transformation of the plexiform neuromas that they do not term red, they do not increase in size very rapidly or they have developed pain or not. And uh, annual neurological examination, then examination for the scoliosis, osteoporosis. At each visit, we need to have their BP. Uh, and annual monitoring uh, of growth until puberty is recommended. So surveillance is the most important part of the management of these uh, patients. For NF2, uh, only surgical excision of uh, the cosmic neuromas is recommended and anti-VGF, that is devastatumab, is now shown to reduce the size of schwannomas and have improved the hearing loss also. So next uh, thing is, uh, ne next disorder that I will cover is the tuber sclerosis. So this was first described in 1862 with an incidence of uh, one in 5,800, but there's no ethnic or sexual differences, but although there's no Indian data, this is a global data that I'm telling you. So uh, this is also caused by uh, the genes that is TSC1 and TSC2, but both of these disorders, but both of these genes lead to the same disorder. So the protein is tuberin and the other protein is hematin. Both of these proteins act in conjunction. So the case this data discussed this, there was a nine month old female who had infantile spasm. So here we can see uh, the the tubers, these are the cortical tubers. So there's a, there's a thickened cortex, these are called cortical tubers. And the skin lesions, this hypomended skin lesion that we can see is the uh, hypomelanotic macules. That is, a, that is also called the ash leaf macules. And the father who is 30 year old, who is intellectually normal, he has this adenoma sebaceum that is on the face and the chagrin patch that is a very uh, skin colored elevated lesion on the back. This is called the chagrin patch. So this disorder also shows a variable expressivity, although it has a 100% penetrance. So in the genetics, it is also more dominant, almost 100% penetrance with variable expressivity. A mutation in either TSC1 or TSC2 will confirm the diagnosis, but the diagnosis is mostly clinical. 80% of these mutations are de novo, of which 80% is TSC2 mutation. So de novo means that the, the, this mutation has originated new in the child and is not inherited from any parent. And 20% will be familial, of which 50% will be TSC1, 50% will be TSC2. Then uh, this disorder also has, a, has some diagnostic criteria. So uh, these diagnostic criteria were very recently updated and uh, that included the genetic diagnosis also. So identification of a pathogenic variant in TSC1 or 2 will confirm the diagnosis. But for the clinical diagnosis, we have some major and minor criteria. I'll not be reading out all. This is just a theory part. So any two major features or one major feature with two minor features will uh, classify into the definite, uh, definite case. So I just have some... I took them from internet only. So this is the adenoma sebation that we can see on the face. Then these are the Ashley's macules we saw in the child also. Then this is the shagreen patch, which is a skin colored, very vase elevated, rough and or crinkled appearance patch. Then uh, this is the fibrous cephalic plaque. Then the, this is the angle, periangle fibromas that we can see on the nails. Then the, this is the dental pit that we can see here in the teeth. And then these are this is the intraoral fibroma. So here also in the tuberous losses also we can see that there is some overgrowth of the tissues. So uh, I'll tell you the pathophysiology later on. So for the management for uh, subepidermal giant cell astrocytoma, surgical removal or everolimus uh, can be given. So everolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. So mTOR is the pathway by which the TSE1 and TSE2 genes act. For uh, renal angiomyelopomas, everolimus is approved. 
and for the facial angio fibromas topical everolimus is approved for seizures we have some specific drug that is called the vigabatin that's a uh, gaba uh, gaba analog so pathophysiology in the same pathway where we saw the nf1 and nf2 acting the same pathway the tuberin hamartin complex acts as this mtor so so basically this also acts like a uh, inhibitor of the cell growth and division. So whenever this complex is lost, we have some uncontrolled cell division and cell growth that will lead to the formation of some tumors. So next thing is the Sturge-Weber syndrome. So Sturge-Weber syndrome is very common. I think everybody must have seen it right now. So this is an encephalofacial angiomatosis. This is mostly sporadic. It is mostly not inherited. Why? Because it is caused by a somatic mutation in the GNAQ gene. So, so uh, there are some uh, somatic mutation and there are some germline mutations. Uh, so somatic mutations, that, that means that occur in some specific type of cells. So if we need to check the mutation is present or not, we, we can't do it in the blood. We have to do it from the specific tissue where this lesion is present. So these children present with port wine stain and leptomeningeal capillary venous malformation, that is parietal and occipital cortex mostly. And the perfusion imaging suggests that the impaired venous drainage from the evolved brain region results in an impaired arterial perfusion that causes it. So this child where we saw was, was, was an eight-month-old male with this port wine stain. So, this has uh, MRI shows the cortical atrophy and also the tram track calcification here, the white thing that we see. So this uh, child has a uh, sturge rubber syndrome. So what are the risk factors with a child who has a port wine stain? So a child born with a port wine stain on the face has just 6% chance of having sturge rubber, sturge rubber syndrome. So not all the children with this port wine stain will be having sturge rubber syndrome. Now, but this increases to 26% when this port wine stain is located in the distribution of the thalamic branch of the trigeminal nerve and 33% if it is bilateral in what and is extensive. So this third river syndrome has a classification that is classified as type 1, type 2, and type 3. So type 1 has this port wine stain plus the ocular abnormalities plus this intracranial uh, leptomeningeal vascular malformation. So all three are present. This is called type 1. Type 2, uh, in type 2, there are no brain abnormalities. And in type 3, the brain abnormalities are present, but there is no uh, ocular abnormality and there's no cutaneous uh, lesion. So uh, in the clinical features, these patients present with seizures and 33% uh, have sleep paralysis. Some can have stroke and stroke-like episodes. 50 to 60% can have developmental delay or intellectual disabilities. For the seizures, uh, for the management, actually, we have we can manage only the seizure part. So seizure control, uh, for the seizure control, uh, oxcarbazepine and levetiracetam uh, can be given and low-dose aspirin is added for the stroke or stroke-like episodes. So the patients with urinary lesions, uh, surgery can be done if two or more anticonvulsants uh, with, with combined with the low-dose aspirin have failed. Uh, so we, we can do the hemispherectomy, which gives us very good results. So the next uh, disorder is the VHL. VHL is also an autosomal dominant disorder, which is present on uh, 3P, that is chromosome 3 and a short arm. So basic pathological lesion is a capillary hemangioblastoma. So this is also divided in two types, type 1 and type 2. Uh, they have a uh, so type one has a low risk of pheochromocytoma and type two has a very high risk of pheochromocytoma. I will not be covering the details in this. So clinical uh, features may they present with multiple types of tumors. So they are hemangioblastomas of the brain, hemangioblastomas of the spine, they're then retinal hemangioblastomas or renal cell carcinomas, pheochromocytomas, then endolymphatic sac tumors of the middle ear or serous cystadenomas and neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. So there are multiple types of tumors that we can uh, see. So these were some um, uh, some disorders that I covered in brief, and I, I know I was very fast, but then uh, I'll just tell you some take home messages. So these neurocutaneous syndromes are collectively very common. Most of them are autosomal dominant. They have expressivity, but family screening is important because we can find uh, other family members also with, with some other, other clinical features. Surveillance and monitoring is the most important thing in the management and the prenatal diagnosis is possible. So genetic testing is always recommended. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit. In a very short time, you gave a very nice review of the topic and discussed the important uh, syndromes associated with the disease. Uh, as I think there are no further questions, uh, I would request our chairperson, ma'am, uh, to, uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Amit. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Amit. It was uh, you nicely covered in a very short span of time, actually. Uh, that was very good because uh, now we are moving towards the last uh, talk of this session. So I think everybody is meeting. Hello. Yes, oh, yes, yes okay. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please go uh, I think now we can move to the last talk of the session. Dr. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Meenal Agrawal. Uh, she has done her MD, Ops and Tiny, and then BM Medical Genetics from HGPI Lucknow. Currently, she is serving as the Director of Clinical Genetics Med Genome Lab, but previously she has worked as Pune, KEM Hospital Pune, Happy Genes Genetic Clinic Pune, 
and then a young professor at Dubai Patil Medical College, Delhi, and she has also worked as faculty at Sanjay Gandhi PGI, Lucknow. Uh, she is also the founder member of Indian Academy of Medical Genetics. She has published more than 40 publications and she has three books to her credit. Okay, Dr. Meenal, to you, please. Thank you so much, madam. Can I share my screen, please? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity and to connect with my colleagues again. And thank mm -hmm. you, madam, for giving um, us the introduction. So without any further delay, I will start on to the presentation. Thank you to my previous speakers who made my job a pretty much easier. So rather than talk, talking about a specific symptom or the sign, I will be giving you an overview how a clinician or a neurologist can go about a genetic testing. And for next 20 minutes or so, I will be briefly covering a basic of genetics, the importance of genetic testing in neurology basic approach to a neurology case with the presumed genetic etiology and as a clinician what things actually five things to remember when you ordering a genetic test and a bit focus on a pre-test counseling and making clinical observation and shaping it with the testing laboratory a couple of case scenarios these scared you have to really decipher and decode that report for the patients and as Dr. Shivani and Dr. Moni has also addressed in our talks, there is always, you have to go back to the phenotype and make a joint effort for a genotype, phenotype correlation and provide the maximum information to the family. So brief about the non-geneticist here. So how do these genetic disorders arise? As we all know that each of human beings arise or develop from a single cell. That cell is made up from one sperm and one ovum that itself, they are single cell. And whatever genetic contribution in that zygote or single egg that is passed on to every cell of the body. And even if there is no family history, if there is everything is normal, there is two to 5% of chance that every live born child is expected to have some genetic disorders. And this risk is increased if there is a marriage between relatives, if there is a teratogen exposure, there's a family history of genetic disorders and so on and so forth. So every human body is made up of billions and trillions of cells. And when a non-geneticist think about a genetic architecture, what it is, actually it is made up of 46 chromosomes that makes it 23 into two, and each set of the pair, each set of the chromosomes coming from the each parent. It could also be used at the six billion bases or the alphabets, which only comprise of A, T, and G, C. The whole genomics can also be viewed as uh, 24,000 genes into pairs. One comes from mother and one comes from the father. Out of these 24,000 genes, only 6,000 to 10,000 genes are clinically relevant. And that's what you test in the clinical exome sequencing. So genetic testing is like a camera. So when you want to take a picture, you have to decide that you want a panoramic view or you want a targeted view. And based on that, you set your camera setting what kind of resolution you want and what is the type of camera it is an slr camera what is a mobile camera so based on that the genetic test also refer the karyotype microarray exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing gives you a panoramic view with increasing resolution Up, on the other hand there is a targeted testing what dr mayan described in the in his talk that if you want to see only smn1 gene go for an mlpa testing if you want to look for only DNA gene, go for an MLPA testing. Dr. Shivani also said, if you want to go about the first year test for microcephaly, go for an ASPM gene sequencing. And that's what the targeted testing differ. Next generation sequencing, I'm sure you all must have heard of, is a very high resolution panoramic snapshot. It is a high resolution, it's a panorama, but you need a lens to see what you want to know. And that's why what, um, uh, previous speakers described the clinical observations and genotype phenotype correlation means once you got, get the genetic report you have to go back to the family go back to the patient and revise your phenotype these are the five most important platforms which you will be using your clinical practice one karyotype second microarray third mlpa or fish fourth next generation sequencing and fifth is triplet prime pcr i'm not going to talk about in this detail but Today, in today's era, next generation sequencing is the most common test because the bioinformatic pipelines allows us to look for the targeted view as well as the panoramic view as far as you tell the laboratory, what do you want? 
So all these molecular testing begin from DNA. And what is DNA? As I said, that these are 6 billion alphabets presented, presented in the nucleus of each cell. So this DNA can be extracted from any cell of the body which has the nucleus. Typically, it is done from the white blood cells, which is preserved in the EDTA blood. And in that DNA, you are looking for the genes. You can imagine is a big encyclopedia, which has two volumes, two identical volumes. It is two set of the genomes. And each set has 23 chapters, that is the chromosomes, and each chromosome has certain paragraphs which make sense, which are the genes and certain paragraphs which do not make any sense. You will have to check all those paragraphs for errors, gaps, and misreading. The top picture is an ARMS PCR followed by an Sanger sequencing. The row down below is next generation sequencing. The right one, are, upper one is MLPA and the lower one is the microarray. I'm showing you all this so that once you get the result, you are familiar with what has been tested in your sample. Why are we discussing it? What is the burden of neurogenetic disorders? As we all know that in a genetic practice, almost one third or even more are the part of our clinical presentation. But 30% of our cases we see they belong to neurology in one or the other way. The clinical presentations are very vague and overlapping as Dr. Shivani rightly said that microcephaly is just a sign. Epilepsy is just a sign. Developmental delay is just a sign. Dr. Poonam also described it beautifully that ventriculomegaly is just a sign and it can be associated with so many syndromes and so many conditions. There is one gene in which can be associated with various phenotypes, like <clears throat> the previous speaker said that in tuberous sclerosis, you can have the multiple presentation. Neurofibromatosis, you can have multiple presentation. And for one phenotype, there can be many genes. For seizures and epilepsy, there will be more than 200 genes which are responsible. And we need to know about it to uh, practice in our clinical scenario. And neurology is an ever-evolving clinical domain, uh, domain. At birth, you can just see the small birth head size, but it can later evolve to an epileptic encephalopathy. Or at birth, the child was normal, and genital history was normal, but at three years of age, you notice an autism spectrum disorder or ADHD feature. So this is an ever-evolving clinical domain. Dr. Moni also spoke about neurodegenerative disorders, which can have an onset postnatally at various ages. And all genetic principles applies to neurogenetic that disorders can be autosomal or extinct, it can be dominant recessive. The variable expressivity means the, uh, the same mutation can express in severity or age of onset. Reduced penetrance means even the same family member having the same mutation might not even express the disorders in any which way. It can be sporadic, a single case or multiple family members can be involved. It is a de novo. It means that mutation has arised in the zygote itself by the time sperm and ovum genetic genes were meeting. And these are not inherited from your parents. And then anticipation, which is a typical feature of triplet repeat disorder, where age of onset and severity increasing with every passing generation. And I cannot stress upon more than genotype phenotype correlation because genetic testing is the need of the hour. And once you get the genotype report as a clinician, you need to go back to the family and get the phenotype correlated. Uh, another question I am frequently asked is who should be offered a genetic testing? So as a clinician, when you are ordering a genetic testing, be sure why are you doing that? So the first important is genetic testing is required for an appropriate diagnosis. An example could be a neuromuscular disorder or neuronal steroid lipofuscinosis where nobody is doing the biopsy, which is an invasive testing. The second most important bucket where you require a genetic testing is it aids in prognosis and the management decision. As previous speaker told that if you know the cause of epilepsy, we can do the targeted treatment. And the important example is epileptic encephalopathy, where the based on mutation, the drug therapy can be selected. Can help predicting other organ complications and provide surveillance because these um, uh, uh, signs or these genetic mutation can point towards uh, syndromic presentation and the examples are dystrophinopathy and myotonin dystrophy where the other organs can also be affected and you know what surveillance and what is screening need to offer them. Dr. Shivani also said that MRI finding needs to be noticed because they are a part of a known syndrome with suspected genetic etiologies like leukodystrophy, lesencephaly primary, microcephaly, so on and so forth. And of course, I cannot stress upon that, that those families with, who are interested in the prenatal diagnosis in today's scenario, nothing can be offered if you have not established a genetic etiology in the family. And ideally, it has to be done before pregnancy and very early during the pregnancy. 
And yes, academic interest is the important cause because for the resident's thesis and for publication, you need a minimum basic genetic testing and to have an understanding for it. So step one, are you ordering a genetic testing? So you need to ask yourself, why are you doing this? And first and foremost is how will the family be benefited? It's a better management, it's for prenatal diagnosis, defined prognosis, plan their life and lifestyle, academic interest. What is it? Why are you ordering a genetic testing? Answer to yourself. Second, step two, we cannot stress upon that because we being a clinician, we always start from the history and examination. And of course, each, each question in the history you ask or each examination you make, take you towards an appropriate diagnosis and making a better genotype phenotype correlation. Typical history, what we ask is if the marriage is consanguineous or not, is the marriage is between blood related or not, it is a sporadic or familial, what is the onset progression, it is a syndromic presentation, it is a phenotype like an epilepsy, microcephaly, or, or it's a kind of a vague presentation, global developmental delay, autism, these are very, very vague presentation and can be a part of a sporadic disorder or a part of a syndromic condition. What is your provisional diagnosis? Even if it is a phenotype group, even if it is a microcephaly, please make notes what is your provisional diagnosis and provide differential diagnosis to the laboratory which is performing your genetic testing. Otherwise, we won't be doing justice to provide the true report to the family. And why are we important? Because it helps us identifying what kind of genetic testing we need. We need a microarray, we need a next generation sequencing, we need an MLPA. So once you have your provisional diagnosis and differential diagnosis in your mind, you will be able to come down to a cost-effective diagnostic yield. So if we are doing an extensive academic setting, of course, whole genome sequencing will be the best. But when you are sitting in a clinical practice, you, know, uh, you have to provide the cost-effective, which is pocket-friendly, and still provide the best diagnostic yield. And obviously, it helps in the familial segregation and genotype phenotype correlation. Step three, genetic etiology. So once you have made a provisional diagnosis, like a spinal muscular atrophy, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you need to read and you need to know about what type of genetic tests are known so that you can select an appropriate genetic test. So broadly, it could be a chromosomal disorder, it is, can be a single gene disorder, or it can be a multifactorial disorder. Amongst the single gene disorders, there can be multiple types of defects. The two most common types of defects are copy number variation and single nucleotide variation. And the third most important are triplet repeat, which is a hallmark of spinocerebellar ataxia, Huntington's chorea, and fragile X syndrome. If you do not know where to go and read about it, please do not take help of Wikipedia and general reviews on Google. Go to authentic sites. These are mentioned over there. Gene reviews, OMIM and PubMed reviews articles are a good cause and the reliable source. And based on the genetic defects which are known to that particular disorder, choose the platform. Like, if you know that there is a single gene and deletions are the known cause, go for MLPA, like SMA and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. If you know that a single mutation is responsible for the 98% of the cases, like a contraplasia, you have to go for a targeted testing, a simple Sanger sequencing or QPCR would do the job. But if you know, if you do not have any idea and you know that copy number variation or deletions and duplications can happen anywhere across the genome, choose microarray. Talk to the laboratory scientist if needed about the coverage of targeted genes and region because that's when you will be doing justice to the family's money, what they are spending on. Then step, pre-test counseling. Once as a clinician, you have decided that you are going for a particular genetic test, you have chosen a genetic platform, you have talked to the laboratory and they're going for it. You have to plan a pre-test counseling session and explain how will it benefit the family explain that what is the expected diagnostic yield and what are the possible outcome. The possible outcome in a genetic testing can be three. It can be negative or normal. It can be a pathogenic or likely pathogenic where you have found the etiology to explain the genetic condition. Or it could be somewhere in between when the laboratory and scientists are not sure what it does to the patient. And at that point of time, this is defined as variant of unknown significance. To give you an idea, this is the most significant problem where world genetics communities are dealing with because there is so much of data generated and about 30 to 50 percent of genetic reports are going as variant of unknown significance and when you get that as a clinician you have to go back to the family and provide the further uh, dissection to this classification the expected diagnostic yield can be 100 percent in cases of down syndrome or to five to ten percent in the cases of autism but 
the families need to be need to tell need to be told beforehand what is the expected diagnostic aid because they must be spending about 15 to 20000 of rupees for a single test and when they see a negative report they kind of get disappointed that they have not found um, a significant variant so they need to tell them and of course the cost that turn around time can be prohibitive sometimes and we need to talk about it and of course if they have any answers question we have to um, address to them and then final talk to the lab and place order and that is what is important because you know in your head that this is the diagnosis this is a differential diagnosis you want this you order the lab and you are expecting this but from the laboratory you get something like this this is neither a horse nor a donkey but it is a variant of unknown significance or something which is not matching your phenotype to avoid this what i cannot stress on is select test carefully what kind of genetic defects are known what kind of genetic platform you need to select and talk to the laboratory team if needed uh, just a bit of slide of uh, next generation sequencing technology so this is the most advanced and most routinely used technology nowadays in which millions and millions of dna strands are analyzed in single experiment you can imagine that millions of people are reading that encyclopedias separate paragraphs together so the time to read that encyclopedia one after the other is significantly reduced and this is the most commonly used platform being used nowadays but once you read so many paragraphs you read so many sequences you have to identify that from which part of human genome from 6 billion alphabets from for, uh, from the encyclopedia from which part of chapter they are arising from and this is like a giant jigsaw puzzle to solve where you are aligning millions of fragments to the human reference genome and that reference genome is then uh, analyzed for a spelling mistake gaps and errors and it is a more than 30 steps process and it takes usually three to four weeks to generate a report so if the laboratory tells you the turnaround time is three to four weeks don't get annoyed on them because this is the minimum time frame a report can be generated and because each one of us is different from each other, each one of us is unique. When we do such kind of large scale genomic testing, we are bound to get some genomic variations. To give you an example, in a clinical exome testing, we are on an average, we get 10,000 spelling mistakes, we get 10,000 um, variants. In a whole exome sequencing, we get 100,000 variants. And out of those spelling mistakes, we have to um, pull down to the one to two variant in a single gene so that they can explain the phenotype and they can give family the answers. So it is an humongous task. And actually from the variant to report generation, there is a huge process. So each variant is analyzed whether it is, can contribute to the phenotype or not. If this has not been, if this has been reported with the previous affected individual or not, if this has been conserved across species because it is functionally important, what is the bioinformatics prediction said? Why, whether it has been reported in the normal population or not, and so on and so forth. And finally, every variant is classified into two categories, three categories rather: a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant, a variant of unknown significance, and the benign. Likely and pathogenic or pathogenic variant is usually the cause of your symptom, uh, uh, cause of your symptoms in your family in about 99 percent of the times the variant of unknown significance needs to be classified again based on your clinical inputs and the laboratory inputs so this is an interdisciplinary team approach example so this family came to us with the three previous pregnancy mishaps first child all three of them were preterm delivery first child had lethargy and died at two hours of hospital admission Second is still alive, but dealing with squarely cerebral palsy. The third child I was asked to examine who was delivered at 32 weeks and had some facial muscle weakness. There was no consanguinity, but when I spoke to the mother and asked to uh, make the fist, this was an observation I made. This is a myotonia. Dr. Moni also presented, I guess, the case. So this is a typical case of myotonic dystrophy, which is caused by a triplet repeat expansion. I'm highlighting on this case because this is a clinical observation which guided towards the type of genetic testing. This kind of genetic defect will not be picked up by the microarray or NGS, and this has to be a separate test. The separate test was ordered. The mother was known to have expansion in the MPK gene, and this uh, disorder is passed on to the future children because it is known to expand further by a maternal transmission, and all three kids are affected. 
Uh, you will see this in common scenario where the genetic testing confirmed your clinical suspicion, 40 years, peripheral neuropathy, NCV told the malignant neuropathy. And though the next generation sequencing is not the best test to see the duplication, to get, nowadays bioinformatic pipeline can predict it and this heterozygous duplication. You can see the higher peak for this blue line. This blue line belongs to the few exons of PMP22 genes and duplication in this gene are known to result into the Charcot's variety of disease or demyelinating neuropathy. Similar scenario, similar presentation in the younger age, demyelinating neuropathy. Suspicion was the same, but next generation sequencing gives the single nucleotide variant in a homozygous state in SH3TC gene, and where you see a green, it means all um, uh, the, the, both the copies of the genes are affected with this mutation, and this is consistent with the diagnosis of Charcot's variety of disease type 4 C. Genetic testing established the etiology of penal diagnosis. As I said before, if your family is interested in the penal diagnosis, you have to establish the genetic etiology. This history, 10 years, very typical um, case of a something like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, MN normal, and the second year test, next generation sequencing was ordered and a homozygous mutation was um, observed in SGCB gene, which is responsible for very similar sarcoglycanopathy. And now the family is ready to be given a prenatal diagnosis and um, genetic testing could give them the answer that why it has happened in their family. And there are about eight to 10% of scenario where the clinical suspicion was something different and the genetic testing gave them alternative answers. 40 years, something like L-DOPA responsive dystonia and the probable diagnosis for Parkinsonism or neurodegeneration with brain RNA accumulation. But on next generation sequencing, whole exome sequencing, we found um, biallelic means uh, both the copies genes were having mutation in SPG7, which is having an overlapping phenotype. And this is already known in the literature that in about eight to 10% of the cases, the diagnosis is alternate what you have suspected otherwise. Other scenarios uh, where the genetic testing uh, provides the alternate diagnosis, this child was suspected to have a multiple sulfatase deficiency, ichthyosis, and the diagnosis was sjogren larsen syndrome based on the genetic testing because genes don't lie. Your clinical experience, uh, you might not have seen that case ever before because genetics is rare, but the genetic testing and genes don't lie. So whenever you get a genetic report, please go back see whether it is matching with your phenotype or not. Another question, Questions I am frequently asked in a case of neurology that developmental disability, which test is the best? There is no golden rule for that. But generally what I go about is if there is a facial gestalt or a syndrome in diagnosis like Down syndrome, like Prader-Willi syndrome, like Angelman syndrome, go for targeted testing because they are going to give you a cost-effective diagnostic yield. If you're not sure what is it, go for cytogenetic microarray first. But if there is a history of consanguinity to or more children affected, probably an exome sequencing with copy number analysis would be the best to go. And as I have highlighted previously, prenatal diagnosis can only be offered if the genetic or the molecular cause is established in the family. Uh, this is a typical uh, case uh, of where we suspected a prader willi syndrome and the ML MSMLPA gave us the diagnosis. But in past 10 years, more than 2,000 such deletion duplication syndrome have been identified and nobody can identify, uh, can remember so many clinical features. So if you have a non-specific uh, intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorders, genome-wide um, cytogenetic microarray test is good, is the best test. Second test, the second question I'm asked is what is, what should we do, panel testing or exome sequencing? Previously about two, three years back when their bioinformatics pipeline were not so strong, not many labs were doing uh, so many panel uh, exome sequencing. Then we used to say, okay, if there are a good diagnostic E in a small number of genes, go for targeted gene panels like germline cancers. But if it is a broader phenotype like developmental delay or autism, go for an exome sequencing. But today for the past two, three years, there is a more inclination towards uh, exome sequencing so that you get um, more significant data and this is important that you provide, as I said before, clinical diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and appropriate report so that you can get a maximum diagnostic yield after your genetic testing. So this is a case where a six-month-old child, consanguineous family, facial dysmorphism, hypotonia, referral diagnosis for Down syndrome, and my colleagues here can certify that this is not Down syndrome. Chromosomal test 
hypothyroidism was done, kerotype was normal, thyroid hormone profile was sent, and he was diagnosed to be a congenital hypothyroidism. And as my previous speakers have also said and highlight, that every dysmorphic child or every child does not require a genetic test. Please hold on to your clinical skill. And in pediatric and pediatric neurology and neurology, this is very important to identify the treatable cause, whether it is genetic or non-genetic, it is our duty to identify the treatable cause so that we can give them the treatment. Now, a couple of slides. What do you do when you receive a genetic test report? You need to read it. Something like that, that if you, if we, if the laboratory has highlighted a spelling mistake, it will give you all the information out of that encyclopedia, which volume, which chapter, which paragraph, which sentence, which word, and which letter change, and what does it do to the clinical phenotype. So you have to read the, you read the report in detail, and you have to see that if it is a dominant disorder, the mutation will be heterozygous. If this is a recessive disorder, it could be a homozygous or compound heterozygous mutation. And as I said, if this is a variant of unknown significance, you always have to go back to the family and try to correlate with the phenotype. <clears throat> and phenotype, phenotype correlation means once you get the genetic report, correlate with the phenotype or symptoms is the joint responsibility of the clinician and the bioinformatician. Last five slides. So once you get the report, you have to go back to the family and explain to them what it means to them. Whatever you had told them in the pre-test session, how much it is fulfilling your promise, and if needed, take an assistance from a genetic counselor. Rule number one for your clinical practice, constant reading of the literature because eyes doesn't see what mind doesn't know. So you have to read and keep a keen observation. Make notes for your observation and provide your notes to the laboratory and review periodically in each visit after genetic report is received so that you can do a genotype phenotype correlation. Discuss with your medical geneticist colleagues, discuss with the genetic counselors, and of course, an interdisciplinary approach and teamwork is required in many of these cases. Provide detailed information to the family, otherwise you will get something which you have not expected. And data is there, the information is there, you have to just provide the right information to get the right diagnosis. And honest and sincere refer to provide pre and post test counseling, accept limitation of genetic testing, clear guidance on variant of unknown significance. I think with this, I will stop here and thank you very much for all the organizers, my speakers, audience, patients, and families. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very elaborate and a very lucid as well. Uh, the way you uh, told about all the various genetic testing options, that was really informative for all of us. And that was a very nice thank session, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, as it is said, I uh, hope my slides are visible. Uh, as it is said, every good thing comes to an end. So it was really an informative session uh, with participants attending through Zoom as well as Facebook live stream. Though being a Saturday, the enthusiasm by the online and offline participants was really encouraging. And on the behalf of PGICH Noida, I would like to thank all the guest speakers who accepted our request to speak on the neurogenetic disorders despite their busy schedule. Uh, we at PGICH also thank today's chief guest, Honorable DGME Ma'am Shimati Shruti Singh for attending the session offline and encouraging us with her support and guidance. I also express my sincere gratitude to our Honorable Director Sir for being the source of guidance behind such academic activities. I am also grateful to our Dean, Professor Dr. D.K. Singh Sir, our former Dean, Professor Dr. Joshna Ma'am, our CMS Sir, Dr. Manish Girhotra, our MS sir, Dr. Akash Raj sir, our ER ma'am, Dr. Sumi ma'am, for being the support for successful occurrence of this symposium. I also thank the faculties and residents who joined the session. The support, support of staff of PGICH is indispensable for such academic activities and symposium. Last but not the least, I thank Medgenome Laboratory for coordinating with us for this symposium. We end today's session with the hope of organizing more such sessions in future. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending.